known as the hidden internet, to store and send indecent material because it makes it harder to trace abusers. The council in Luton has given the go-ahead for a special enforcement zone to be created in an area of the town blighted by prostitution. Police have been given the power to use dispersal orders on anyone they suspect of antisocial behaviour. This even means that anyone under the age of 16 years old found in the area after 9pm could be taken home by officers. In the last 14 months, there have been over 600 incidents of antisocial behaviour reported in Hightown, including curb crawling, drug dealing and intimidation of local residents by young men. The Welsh Assembly is expected to vote in favour of a new scheme which presumes that everyone over the age of 18 who hasn't given their consent will be willing to have their organs used for transplant operations. But there's been opposition from religious communities. A senior MP is warning that the current timetable for building the high-speed two rail line through Buckinghamshire is complete madness. Labour's Margaret Hodge, who chairs the Commons Public Accounts Committee, said it's unrealistic. Her views are echoed by John Rukin from the Stop HS2 campaign. When you're getting that sort of criticism, and you're getting criticism from all of these independent bodies, all the independent economists, all the independent environment, the environmentalists, eventually they are going to have to listen. Milton Keynes has a disproportionate number of people receiving injuries as a result of falling over. That's according to the council, which has set up a falls prevention strategy and implementation group in a bid to buck the trend. Houghton Regis's Houghton Hall Park is set for a facelift thanks to a cash windfall from the Heritage Lottery Fund. The council hopes the restoration, which will involve the creation of a working kitchen garden and a formal garden, will boost community pride. In sport, Andy Murray is through to the Wimbledon quarterfinals after beating Mikhail Yuzhny in straight set, 6-4, 7 Six six one. It means the world number two has yet to drop a set in his first four matches. He now plays Fernando Vadasco in the last eight. The weather mostly dry with sunny spells and a top temperature of 19 degrees Celsius. That's 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. You right, Kath? Oh, yeah. Shall we do it? What? The show. Go on, then. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's what is it, Tuesday, I think? I had such a bad night's sleep. I had the eldest boy in the bed with me. Oh, it was it was relentless. He was having a nightmare in his room, so I went and rescued him. He was screaming, No! Don't make me go in there, please! And I woke him up, I said, What what was going on? What were you dreaming about? A shop. Okay. He was having a nightmare about a shop and then spent the rest of the night kicking me in bed. So thanks for that, son. Never mind, it's all part of the joys of being a dad, isn't it, apparently? Right, this is uh, Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Lots coming up, including a new system of organ donation, which assumes anyone over 18 has agreed to be a donor, unless they've stated otherwise, could be voted through in Wales later. Surely that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Who on earth would vote to opt out of an organ donation scheme? Have men only clubs had their day? Watford Round Table could be forced to close its door after 77 years. Its numbers have dwindled to just seven members. Well, are men only clubs? A slightly outdated concept. And it seems that some people in Stevenage are worried about giant hogweed. Oh, yes, we've got the giant hogweed story. Uh, lots of ways to get in touch. You can go to facebook.com forward slash bbc3cr. As I saw lots of you have been doing the last 24 hours. Thank you for that. 81333, start your text 3CR. Or if you phone up now, you get to speak to uh, work experience Ollie, who's back for a couple of days. So why don't you phone up and say hello to him and then maybe come and say hello to me as well. 08459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Uh, now, we, we, we often have young ears listening to this, so you might want to put some cotton wool in their ears for this next bit, because uh, adult themes are going to be discussed. The number of images of child abuse online is growing dramatically. That's according to a report today from police experts. Last year, the Child Explo- Exploitation and Online Protection Centre said it had 8,000 reports of indecent images being shared, 70,000 images in total, which was double the number of previous years. And, of course, technology is also playing a greater role in abuse too. Tara Gungafal has more. Tara, what is SEOP reporting? Well, as you just mentioned there, a big rise in the number of abuse images and that they're being actually screened using social media sites and things like Skype. So it's live streaming or something that's been recently recorded oh to some sort of video standard. Um, now, 
It's a horrible, actually. Do you yeah. know, it's absolutely revolting. But CEOP is estimating that around 50,000 people in the UK are involved in downloading and transferring um, images of abuse like this. Um, so the numbers are pretty high. And CEOP's chief executive, Peter Davis, says uh, they, they're they using these new techniques, but also it gives people an option to be able to anticipate what's happening next with social media. So, mm. so there is an option to actually step in at this point and be able to say you know this could happen so what we need to be doing and what different organizations and this is a police-based organization what what they need to be doing is yep. is thinking ahead um trying to work out exactly where the next stream of development might be for people who use images like this and, and stepping in and stopping it before it happens okay. or at least clamping down on it a bit quicker um and the police and criminal justice minister damien green has said you know these figures are deeply tr- troubling and i think the vast majority of the UK would agree with that. Yep. And they show how our understanding of child sexual exploitation has greatly improved in recent years. But obviously it picks out some holes as well, doesn't it? Well, it does. And it, uh, it's good they've acknowledged that. But the numbers of children suffering from abuse is high too, isn't it? Yeah, and they're actually suggesting that it's one child in 58. Really? That yeah. seems a considerable amount. Yeah, it seems exceptionally high. Yeah. Um, and also, although they see so many, and they've said that... Um, they're looking at 10,000 new cases every year in the UK. I think one of the reasons that it's so high is that it's an estimate because they can't have uncovered every single case that happens. Mm. Or it's really hard, actually. It'd be really useful to find out how they estimate these figures. Because yep. one in 58 is massive. Yeah. Um, whether or not that, that includes the worst case of... That just only includes the worst cases of child abuse. Mm. Or whether it is something that might be deemed to be minor, but obviously still has a huge effect on yeah. the individual who's, who's suffered it. So that's what they're talking about. One child in every 58, 10,000 new cases every every year in the UK. Um, and there's also, in this report that CEOP's produced, um, some information about how abusers are targeting vulnerable children. Well, that yes, you can imagine that that would be the case, but yep. they're talking about children who might come from certain backgrounds. They might not have as much money. They might not have access to <clears throat> some things that other children might enjoy, and it makes them more vulnerable to grooming, for example. Yeah. And they're also talking about a 70% increase in the number of girls under 10 being abused as well. Um, and the NSPCC has been asked to comment on this report too. Um, and it's looked at, although, you know, we think of cases of child abuse and we think, oh no, stranger danger. Yes. Um, the NSPCC has come out and said the vast majority of these offences, and they're looking at around nine out of ten, are committed by someone the child knows. And the, they reported a change in behaviour of the abusers as well, haven't they? Yeah, they're saying that the, the abusers seem to be spending less time trying to groom a child, but more time trying to groom more children oh dear okay um so they're spreading their net wider i don't know whether or not social media allows them to do that much more simply because it certainly would um for example if you were on a facebook site yep. and you wanted to speak to young children although children under the age of 13 aren't allowed to have accounts although we know that they do and yeah. some parents turn a blind eye to that um then it might be a lot easier to speak to a greater number of children in one go. Um, and CEOP is also saying that there have been more than 1,100 reports of online child sexual exploitation in the last year. So they're really high. The figures are really high. Mm. And they're saying in nearly 70% of those cases, the adult failed to commit the abuse. So so fortunately, some of these revolting individuals aren't actually very good at it. Lots of, lots of attempts, but very little success. But still, any success is... Uh, is well, there's a depressing start to the show, Tara. Thank you for that. It was interesting figures. Thank you very much indeed. 08459... Four double five, five double five. I find that figure: one child in fifty-eight will suffer actual sexual abuse before the age of uh, of eighteen. That's an incredible statistic. If that's true, that's amazing. Oh dearie me! Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. If you want to have your say on that, or you can go to facebook.com forward slash BBC Three CR. Another thing we're talking about this morning. Should we have an opt-in or opt-out system when it comes to organ donation? I think we should have an opt-out. But every It's assumed that all bits of your body are up for grabs unless you've said otherwise. Who on earth would opt out of a compulsory organ donation scheme? Surely no one can disagree with that, can they? 08459 455 555.
seriously, if you said, do you know what? No, I'm going to opt out of giving my organs for donation after I die. There's got to be something wrong with you, hasn't there? 08459 four double five five double five. If we had an opt-out system, so it was assumed, this could be going ahead in Wales, it was assumed that everybody's organs were up for grabs unless you said otherwise. Who on earth would opt out? You'd have to be pretty callous, wouldn't you? 08459 four double five five double five is the phone number. You can go to the Facebook page as well, if you like, facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR, or you can send me a text, 81333. Start your text, 3CR. I'm a little bit down this morning. Apart from being tired, I bought two new albums by my fa- two of my favourite bands, one by the Beach Boys and one by the Bare Naked Ladies. They're both a bit disappointing. They're both, the Bare Naked Ladies listened to it yesterday and came away thinking, hmm, this is rubbish. The Beach Boys, Beach Boys Live, from their tour last year, their 50th anniversary tour, put that on the car this morning. Oh, let's just say live should be in inverted commas. A lot of studio trickery has gone into making that live album. Because they didn't sound that good when I saw them. Oh, no. A lot of studio trickery has gone into that. Disappointing, Beach Boys. Right, uh, 6.15, let's get the travel. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. So far today, everything looking quite good on the roads. Got no incidents to report. Traffic flowing well along the M25, even through the roadwork section between the A1M and the A10, junctions 23 and 25. Some works at the moment in High Wycombe, the A4010 Chapel Lane. Temporary traffic lights are up at the junction with the West Wycombe Road, the A40. They're going to be up for another couple of days. In Wealdstone, if you're driving down toward London, the A409, temporary lights are up for gas main work around Rising Home Road. And they're still doing some works in Kingswood, the A41. Temporary lights for electricity work near Kingswood Lane. If you're travelling by tube this morning, the Metropolitan Line running with minor delays between Wembley Park and Aldgate. This because of a signal failure at Neeston earlier this morning. But a good service on the rest of the line and a good service on all the other tube lines. And trains running to time. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam Glynn. Right, 6.16, it's Tuesday, the 2nd the second of July. I mean, Lee, these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Child protection experts say live footage of children being abused is increasingly available via the internet. The council in Luton has given the go-ahead for a special enforcement zone to be created in an area of the town blighted by prostitution. In sport, Australia Rugby Union captain James Horwill has been cleared to play in Saturday's deciding third test against the British and Irish Lions. The weather today for beds, hearts and bucks, mostly dry, with sunny spells and a top temperature of 19 degrees. Coming up, residents in Stevenage say they fear for children's lives as a highly toxic plant is spreading its wings around the town. We'll find out more before 6.30. BBC Three Counties Radio. Original British drama on BBC One. Do you see John Luther? I've got a killer on the loose. Supposed to be representing the law, and yet it operates in his own sense of justice. You're such a gentle man. I don't know about that. Who is she? Who is she? If you take me down, I'll take you down even harder. Luther returns tonight at nine on BBC One and BBC One HD. See, I've never seen Luther, and that trail makes it sound a li- it makes it sound a little bit rubbish. But I've heard from everybody; it's excellent. I, I just, you know, it's not really my up there song. I'm going to nip out to my car and get my Hanson CD as well. All oh, the new Hanson songs, brilliant. Yeah. Le- while this is on, I'm going to nip out to my car. Be back in a second. You know it all, but you don't know a thing at all, ain't it? Ain't it something, y'all? When somebody tells you something about you, think that they know you more than you do, so you take it down by the pill to swallow. Oh, Mr. Bring Me Down, where well, you, you like to bring me down, don't you? But I ain't laying down, baby. I ain't going down. Can't nobody tell me how it's gonna be. No. 
Residents in Stevenage say they fear for children's lives as a highly toxic plant is spreading like wildfire around the town. Pete Perry says the giant hogweed is still growing after 37 years. If you're a gardening expert or a plant expert or a botanist, is it botany? Could you give me a call and try and explain to me what this hogweed is? I want an expert on the line. I say an expert, I want a listener pretending to be an expert. 08459 four double five five double five. What is giant hogweed? Well, Pete Perry uh, claims the police, the Environmental Health and the Council have all been informed, but the problem hasn't improved. We sent our reporter, Serena Farrow, down to the site to take a look, mainly because it doesn't matter if we lose her. So, Pete, here we are, we're outside Asda, which yeah. is near to where this horrid stuff is. It is indeed, yes. Yeah. North Arts College is right opposite Asda. We've got quite a few students here, so yes. w- would it be harmful to them? We've only got to brush it, and they're small hairs which actually secrete a poison, an irritant. They're rather harmful. It can be very, very painful. And as far as you're concerned, tell us when was the first time you complained? Way back in 75, this is what highlighted it, a boy from Stevenage actually got hospitalised for seven years with this rash. So it's pretty serious. If you just cut it down, which the council has done before, it'll keep growing because the roots will keep growing. And then the seeds, very often they cut it down after it's flowered. The seed then will stay in the ground for four or five years before it starts coming up and flowering again and starts the cycle. We've come to the front of the college and round to the side. The the college authorities have put a hedge along here to stop people get out at it you know so maybe it'd be better to go into yeah. that part there yeah so we've got around the other side now and we have found that they have actually cordoned it off with a fence but the thing is Serena don't forget that a kid could climb over there and get into it really I don't think fencing it off is really gonna cut it to be honest well I suppose because it's across from McDonald's isn't it so I suppose That's, there exactly. are gonna be young people hanging around and That's people right. in the area yeah. describe what this weed looks like cow parsley and even you know you get forms of it in the garden which with pretty coloured flowers on top umbrella flowers a lot of people call them it is umbrella but white these are creamy white aren't they these are creamy white and they can grow up to 10 feet tall so you can't miss them really it's like a giant cow parsley and well it's like a little mini um, umbrella as well isn't it it kind of stalks up Green That's right. It is. It's what they call an umbelliferous plant, which is, means umbrella-like. What? The flowers all grow on a stalk like an umbrella, but they look lovely from a distance. Umbelliferous is not a word. No, I'm not having umbelliferous. Umbelliferous? Is that really a word? I, I'm suspicious. That was our reporter, Serena Farrow. If you know anything about gardens and gardening and plant and plant life. What on earth is giant hogweed? 08459 four double five five double five, please. Now, I played this song yesterday. It's the new single by Hanson. I know, I know. No, don't prejudge, because I tell you what, it is flipping brilliant. Have a listen to this. This is the be- this is better than the new Beach Boys album, I tell you that.
Yeah, I'll have some of that. That's better than the new Bare Naked Ladies and the new Beach Boys albums put together. Hanson, who will be coming on the show at some point, maybe this week, maybe next week. Who knows? Who knows? Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio, 08459 455 555. If you chose to opt out of donating your organs, there's got to be something wrong with you, hasn't there? Travel news for beds, hearts and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Still looking pretty clear on the major routes this morning. Some works that you might get caught up in through Bedford. There are some temporary lights along the A6 around the junction with Bromham Road. They're not in use at all times, but it could slow things down a bit. In Hitchin, the A505 roadworks at the Cambridge Road junction. Amersham and White Lion Road, the A404. Temporary lights for gas main work around Loudhams Road. And in Beaconsfield, on the A40, you'll find works between Lakes Lane and Piebush Lane. And from there, down the A355 does tend to get quite busy as the morning wears on. Things looking clear, though, on the motorways. No M1 or M25 problems. And on the trains, no issues either. Plus, good news for the tubes, because the Metropolitan Line is back to running a normal service after a signal failure at Neasden earlier this morning. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. Speaks to you in 15 minutes. 6.30, here's the news and sport with Catherine Boyle. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. the headlines, child protection experts say live footage of children being sexually abused is increasingly available via the internet. The council in Luton has given the go-ahead for a special enforcement zone to be created in an area of the town blighted by prostitution, and the Welsh Assembly is expected to vote in favour of a new scheme which presumes that anyone over 18 who hasn't already given their consent would be willing to have their organs used for transplant operations. Three Counties Sports BBC Three Counties Radio Let's start with rugby. Australian captain James Horwell has been cleared to play in Saturday's third and deciding uni- rugby union test against the British and Irish Lions. Our correspondent Ian Robertson reports. There was a great deal of surprise when James Horwell was cleared after he was cited for stamping on Alan Wynne Jones during the first test. The QC from New Zealand who heard the case concluded that on the balance of probabilities he could not find an intentional or deliberate action of stamping or trampling. The International Rugby Board appealed against this decision. Today, Graham Mew, the independent appeal officer, rejected that appeal. He stated the judicial officer was not manifestly unreasonable or clearly wrong in his decision. So James Horwell can now play in the third test on Saturday. Andy Murray will play Fernando Vadasco in the Wimbledon quarter-finals after beating Mikhail Yuzhny in straight sets. Today, it's women's quarter-final day. On centre court, the top remaining seed, Agnieszka Radvanska, takes on Lee Na. That's followed by former champion Petra Kvitova against Kirsten Flipkins. Over on court, court one, Sabine Lezicki, who knocked out Serena Williams, play, plays Kaya Kanepi, while Sloane Stevens takes on Marion Bartoli. Olympic long jump champion Greg Rutherford's been responding to the criticism of his form since London last year. The Woburn Sands-based athlete finished second at the Diamond League meeting in Birmingham at the weekend, but says he's not fully fit due to fluid on the knee. It's just about trying to stimulate my body to, to remove it, but for whatever reason, it's been really persistent and won't go. And the issue has been with that, if you look at my jumps technically at the moment, I'm not able to do the lateral step that I was doing so well last year that was helping me jump so far. And I'm having to revert back to something that I'm not comfortable with. And that's your latest news and sport. I'll be back with more at seven o'clock. I can think of a few people, Catherine, who wouldn't mind stimulating uh, Greg's body to remove the fluid from his aforementioned knee. Is that housemaid's knee? I don't know. It, it sounds a Is bit it wim- water on the knee. I don't know. Why don't you know? I don't, because I'm an idiot. Oh. Just pretend to be clever so the listeners think I'm cool. Oh, well, you're winning. Yeah, I know. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, Watford Round Table could be closing. It's only got seven members. What is it? Oh, men-only clubs. Are they a little bit outdated? Now, it's 2013, for goodness sakes. 08459 455 555. Now... Wales is likely to become the first country in the United Kingdom to introduce a system of presumed consent for organ donation today. 
If passed, the new law would mean people need to opt out rather than opt in to the organ donor register. Well, should organ donation be compulsory unless you opt out? Makes perfect sense to me. And I think anyone that disagrees with that, well, there's got to be something wrong with them, hasn't there? Our reporter, Neil Cartmel, has more on the implications of this story. Neil, what effect will this legislation have? Good morning, Ian. Baiting them there. Nice to see. Um, Currently, if you're in all parts of the UK, you have to sign the UK organ donor register. So it's very much an opt-in scheme, as you say. This law, if passed in Wales, will mean that people in Wales will have to opt out. The new um, has... The new bill will have two forms of consent, deemed consent to where someone has died but not signed the register and express consent where they've died but they had signed it. And this will apply to over 18s who lived in Wales for longer than six months and the hope is, by ministers in Wales, that it will provide a 25% increase. And just to say as well that organs that are are taken from Wales can be given to anybody in the UK, so it's not just a, a Welsh thing. Now, surprisingly, not everyone's in agreement with this, are they? No, faith groups have expressed their, some opposition, it's fair to say. Um, Their main concerns about public support, their fear is that an enforced opt-out scheme would undermine trust if families felt their wishes were being ignored or or ridden roughshod over. The Archbishop of Wales, Barry Morgan, says that relatives of those who die should have a bigger say. Just imagine if your distressed relatives, you've been at the bedside of a dying person for three or four days, it's not clear what the wishes are, but you don't want organ removed. Then to have legislation that says they can be removed, I think, is counterproductive and might result in more people opting out. So their fear, and and you can understand this, is that this is a very murky discussion to be embroiled in at a very difficult and sensitive time for people. Are there measures in place to address their concerns? Yeah, I mean, at first reading, it doesn't look as if there are, but actually when you read more closely at the bill, that, that there is some room for manoeuvre. The relatives, or as they call it, friends of long-standing, can object if they know that the deceased would not have consented. The difficulty then is you're in this, in this murky world where you have to persuade medical staff or or officials that that, you're, that that the deceased didn't want to, to donate their organs. That's not really a discussion that many of us would want to have at that particularly difficult time, and that's the point that the faith groups are making at this stage. And will this law, uh, new law have a significant effect, Neil? I think it will, yeah. I mean, certainly within Wales it will, but if, if, we, if we take it as a pilot... Now, it isn't a pilot, but if you were to take it that way and you imagine it was to be rolled out across the rest of the UK, when you consider that three people die every day in the UK because not enough organs are available, you can see already the possibility when you think that one person that dies has the potential to save or at least affect nine lives because they can donate nine parts of their body. You can then see that there's a huge possibility there if this law were to, to come into force elsewhere as well as in Wales. Neil Cartmel, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> well, I, I'm surprised uh, that, that anybody could object to this. Surely it makes perfect sense. If the, the passing of a loved one, a child or a husband or a wife or a parent, could save, well, at least one person's life, p- possibly more, how could you object to that? How could you object to giving a part of their or a part of your body to someone else. You're saving a kiddie's life. You're You're saving someone's life. You don't need it when you're dead. You're dead. Doesn't matter what happens to you. If you've ever had the misfortune to see the, 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 the dead body of a, of a relative, you know that that's not really them, is it? That they have left. That's just the husk, the shell they were occupying. So why not, you know, give uh, your eyes? Yeah, you can give your eyes or your heart or your liver or whatever it is to save someone's life. I cannot believe there is anybody out there who would choose to opt out of that system. If that's you, give me a call, 08459 455 555. Should organ donation be compulsory unless you opt out? You can go to facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR or send me a text, 81333. Start your text 3CR. We'll talk about it more after David Essex.
show Do you know With your love light shining clearly It's so good to have you Near me so hold Be close, don't let me go And if that road gets weary He's a gypsy, isn't he, David Essex? Gip- comes from gypsy stock, he does, yes. Made uh, the waistcoat and the neckerchief, very fashionable in the 70s. I like a bit of David Essex, he's good, isn't he? He's good, David Essex. Just when you thought the government might have stopped talking about HS2 for a bit. Remember HS2? Remember that? Well, a senior MP is warning that the current timetable for building the rail line is complete madness. The government is confident that parliamentary approval for the project can be achieved by March 2015 so that construction work can get underway the following year. But Labour's Margaret Hodge, who chairs the Commons Public Accounts Committee, says it's unrealistic and will take longer than the three years which were needed to approve Britain's first high-speed rail line, the Eurostar route from London to the Channel Tunnel. This time round, you're dealing with, you know, every aggrieved person in Hampstead right through every constituency you're absolutely joking you you'll get it by, uh, by 15 it's, it's a complete madness don't you understand that um, it's I think just unrealistic it- She was speaking as her committee questioned bosses from HS2. The top civil servant at the Department for Transport, Philip Rutnam, was also being grilled. Mr Rutnam insisted the timescale for getting the project approved by Parliament is realistic, although he admitted it could be tight. I think it is a... Definitely is a challenging timetable. It is clearly a matter you for. You honestly believe it you'll keep to it. You clearly, honestly believe it. It is clearly a matter for both houses of Parliament and the Select Committee how long the hybrid bill takes. He also said uh, that commuters into London from the three counties could be left stranded on platforms unless, uh, unless HS2 goes ahead. He says it's needed to relieve pressure on the West Coast main line and that the southern part of the line could reach a crunch point. Unless we deal with the capacity issue that we're going to face on our rail network, what we will find is that the commuters will not be able to get into London. They will be left standing at the stations on the southern half of the West Coast main line. Well, last week the government announced a multi-billion pound contingency fund to cover the project going over its original budget. It means the amount of public money set aside for the HS2 has gone up from £33 billion to more than £42 billion. But the MPs wanted to know whether the costs could rise even further. 
The General Director of High Speed 2, David Prout, indicated that the contingency fund would not cover a delay in the start of construction work. Oh, hang on a second. There's your 5% chance that we were told about last week. He confirmed it wouldn't cover the cost of changing the planned route to include any extra stations or tunnels. Well, there you go. That's some contingency fund that doesn't cover every contingency. (laughs) That's terrible, isn't it? Well, we'll keep you up to date with what happens on that. Hogsweed. What on earth is Hogsweed? Some people in uh, Stevenage, I think, are are terrified about it. Brian uh, says, you cannot mow Hogweed. Or cut it as it will grow again and put people in danger. What danger does it put them in, Brian? Is this like a triffid? Because the triffids, wouldn't the triffids, they would squirt a poison at you, then eat you. Is, it, is that it? If you get exposed to hogsweed, wash and put sun cream on. What we need to do, this is, Sophie Solari is our report, we need to, we need to rub hogsweed on Sophie. To, no, we need to. Because it's our duty as the BBC to discover these things for you, to inform and educate in an entertaining way. And the way we'll do that is we'll uh, strip uh, uh, Sophie to her grollies and we will rub hogsweed on her. That means underpants, doesn't it? I think it does, or I said something vulgar. Didn't mean, I thought it meant underpants. Uh, and we will rub her with hogsweed. That's, that's going to come up in the next hour, I promise you. <laughs> Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Traffic starting to hit the road. The M24. Or we can strip Adam Glynn to his grollies and rub hogs. Oh, my mic's on. I do apologise. Sorry. (laughs) I'd like to see you try. Well, that sounds like a challenge, Adam. It does, doesn't it? Yes. See you in a bit. M25, anti-clockwise. It's building up Waltham Abbey to Enfield Junction 26 to 25. You've got delays coming in toward London through Boreham Wood on the A1. Queues already from Stirling Corner down to Apex Corner. And a little bit slow in the Brickett Wood area on the A405, the North Orbital Road, as you come down toward the M25 at Junction 21A. But generally, things are looking fine. Speed centres aren't picking up any problems anywhere else. It's still looking clear on the A1 down from St Neots toward the Black Cat Roundabout. No problems yet this morning through Bedford or Milton Keynes. And the A5 through Dunstable's running nicely. No delays for the trains, no delays for the tubes. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. It'd be like that scene in Women in Love, wouldn't it? Right, 6.46. Uh, it's Tuesday, the 2nd of July. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Child protection experts say live footage of children being abused is increasingly available via the internet. The council in Luton has given the go-ahead for a special enforcement zone to be created in the town's red light district. In sport, the tyre manufacturer Pirelli will conduct tests on a current car in a bid to allay safety fears following a series of blowouts at the British Grand Prix this weekend. Coming up before seven o'clock, are men-only clubs like the Round Table a thing of the past? We'll talk about that and more, but before that, let's get the weather. It's Kate Kinsella. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. Well, there's a little more in the way of cloud around compared to yesterday morning, but we're seeing a little bit of sunshine through it. Unfortunately, the holes in the cloud at the moment will quite quickly be be filled in with increasing cloud. Now, there are one or two spots of rain out there, but for the most part, it's looking like it should stay dry through the course of the day. It's overnight tonight where we'll start to see the rain arrive. It's becoming a little bit breezy uh, later on this afternoon at the maximum temperature around 19 Celsius, 66 degrees in Fahrenheit. Now, overnight, the rain will arrive from the uh, the west. It will become more widespread and we could get some heavier bursts in there as well. Now, it's overnight. Good news for gardens um, if you need some rain out there. But the minimum temperature, 12 Celsius, 54 degrees in Fahrenheit. Towards dawn tomorrow morning, this rain is going to turn back to light patchy rain and drizzle and it will move away quite quickly. And after that, it's an improving picture, gradually becoming brighter, some sunny spells and uh, the temperature getting up to around 21 Celsius through tomorrow. For the rest of the week, Thursday there's some rain first thing, but it's an improving picture. Friday, a ridge of high pressure, and the weekend is potentially looking very nice. That's your forecast. Thank you very much, Kate. On the uh, subject of presumed consent, which means that you would have to opt out 
uh, it would be assumed uh, that your organs were up for donation if you died unless you opted out. Uh, Martin on Twitter, who normally sends a lot of offensive nonsense, but has actually sent, tweeted something quite good today. Surely if you opt out, you should also opt out of receiving organs. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, wait, 459 four, double, five, five, double, five. If you've got a problem with a company, a council or an organisation, there's one man you should come and speak to. You've got a problem with a mattress, I gather. Tell me all about it without naming any company name. Jonathan Vernon-Smith. Well, every time she tried to book, the trip was cancelled because of adverse weather. The JVS show fights for your rights and tackles your consumer problems. Said send the receipt off and you'll get the cheque in the post. If you need our help... I went to speak to the man that runs this golf club. Email jvsshow at bbc.co.uk I'm just very pleased that you've got the money. And we could do the same for you. Thanks ever so much, Jonathan. The JVS Show on BBC Three Counties Radio. All I knew This morning when I woke I know something now, know something now I didn't before And all I've seen since 18 hours ago Is green eyes and freckles and your smile In the back of my mind making me feel right I just wanna know, you better know You better know, you better know Everything has changed Oh, my walls Still tall, painted blue But I'll take them down, take them down And open up the door for you And all I feel In my stomach is butterflies The beautiful kind Picking up the last time to Making me feel like like Ed Sheeran's here to stay. I thought he was a flash in the pan, but he's making records with Taylor Swift, so he's he's, he's taking his boots off and he's got his feet under the table. He's going to be around for a long time. Never mind. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Are men only clubs steady like the round table, a thing of the past? Watford Round Table could be forced to close its door after 77 years, after numbers have dwindled to just seven members. At its peak, it had over 40. The group has raised over half a million pounds for good causes. Well, our reporter, Richard Williams, has been out to meet some of those involved. 
I'm Stuart Hart. I'm uh, chairman of Watford Round Table for this year. Uh, we're here tonight uh, because we get together every fortnight to do some social events, and tonight's Top Golf. There's a bit of a misconception about uh, Watford Round Table because we're so well known for fundraising. I think people tend to ignore the fact that, or don't know about the fact that we actually are a, very much a social group, and that's what it was actually set up for. Fundraising was kind of secondary. We've been going for 77 years and over the time, because we've been quite successful at fundraising, we've uh, estimated we must have um, handed out to local charities uh, about half a million pounds. I'm Jane Pattinson, I'm the director of Watford Mencap. Watford Mencap and Roundtable have had a very long-term relationship. It started in the 1960s when they actually purchased Table Hall for us, which enabled us to provide social and leisure activities for people with learning disabilities. They um, purchased the building and then within two years they'd raised enough money to actually pay the mortgage off on the building. And then when the building was later sold because it had just become a little bit dated and beyond use, the money was actually given to Watford Mencap, so we received around £80,000 to help with our current services. We have 120 staff, 140 volunteers and our turnover is 2.2 million but we really rely on people like the Roundtable because we have to fundraise around half a million pounds per year and local groups like Roundtable really help us to raise that extra money. Reach Out Plus is a charity which has benefited from Watford Roundtable's help. They take disadvantaged children on canal boat trips Alan Pedder is their waterways manager. The boat we're on today is called Sheldrake 3. Uh, we take young people away via our Enable programme on a supported trip on the canals uh, up to a week long. It helps them with their self-confidence, they learn new skills. Watford Roundtable have been supporters of ours for a great number of years. 25 years ago, they bought one of our first boats called the Fellowship of Watford. Since then, they've made regular donations to us. And the last one of £1,000, which came in recently, has paid for two young people to go on a supported holiday on the canals for a week. Well, I've come out onto the streets of Watford to see if I can stir up a bit of interest. First question, do people even know what Watford Round Table is? I have absolutely no idea. I haven't got a clue. A round table. I think it's like a secret society kind of rotary club kind of masons, but I'm not too sure. What do you think the target age group is for it of the people who go there? Well, I think it'd probably be ooh, about 40 plus, 40, 50, 60 maybe, something like that. Uh, Mid 20s, uh, late, early 30s. Probably 20s to 20 to 40. The membership issue is quite frustrating. We're down to about five active members, seven actual members. We do need to get uh, our name out there again uh, and get members in uh, because it would be quite sad for us and the community uh, to lose round table. Well, that was our report. Oh, that was our reporter, Richard Williams. Uh, Rob Davis is the newest member of Watford Roundtable. He's on the line now. Good morning, Rob. Morning. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. When did you join, Rob? I joined um, about eight or nine months ago, um, just after I moved to Watford. And why did you join? Well, I mean, I, I moved down here from the north. Um, in fact, it was a year ago yesterday. Um, and when I came down, um, I, I pretty much didn't know anyone in this end of the uh, end of the country. So it was a good opportunity for me to start meeting new people um, and get involved in the, in the community, really. Rob, I, I don't know if you've just moved, but could you go back to where you were? Just the line's breaking up ever so slightly. I'm, I'm keen to hear what you have to say. It is the problem a lot of the people don't know what the round table is. They think it's kind of affiliated with the Masons or something. <laughs> Yeah, probably a, a slight misconception, I guess. Um, it's 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 nothing like that at all. I mean, obviously, we know the Masons are well known for being a secretive organisation and silly handshakes and all this kind of business, but we're nothing about that. It's it's a very um, you know, it's much more of an open group. We're we're not secretive about what we're doing. The slightest. It's about getting people involved in what we're doing, having a good time with friends, meeting new people, and and ultimately um, giving something back to the community alongside if we can. With things like Facebook and Twitter and, and, and the evolving world we're in, do you think groups like the Rotary Club and Roundtable, that they've actually had their day? No, not at all. I mean, I think, I think when we've started to embrace things like uh, Facebook and Twitter in, in recent times. Um, I, I guess they go alongside what we do. I mean, you've got to remember that the social networks are great, but they're an online environment, whereas we're a real-world environment where real people sit next to each other, having a good time and, and, and doing something good. And uh, how are you going to get more members in, Rob? What, what, what's the plan? 
Well, it's it's early days for us, really. We've we've kind of we've started to recently look at how we can start expanding um, the table. I mean, I mean, it's like you heard Stuart talking before. We, you know, numbers have started to dwindle. So um, we just we spoke to the Watford Observer recently, who were very helpful in in trying to get the word out there. And, and of course, I'm, I'm talking to you now. And and, and you know, so we're, we're starting to look at new ways to, you know, to, to, to people know what it is we're about. And uh, and get people involved, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of hard work to do, really. Rob, I, I, I wish you the best of luck if you do want to expand the table. You can get those tables. We've got one at home where you can pull it and the middle bit kind of comes out a little bit. That's Rob Davis uh, from Watford Roundtable. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Patches of slow traffic on the M25. Anti-clockwise, it's looking heavy from Waltham Abbey at Junction 26 through to 25 at Enfield, so that's as you come into the roadworks. Past the A10 there, once you get into the roadworks section, obviously it is slow, but it's not looking too bad. It's looking busy, though, from the M1 to Kings Langley, Junction 21 to 20, and you'll also find it slow from Maple Cross to the M40, Junction 17 to 16. Queues on the A1 through Boreham Wood. Along the Barnet Bypass, you'll find it busy from Stirling Corner toward Mill Hill Circus. Everything else, though, looking at the speed sensors, seems to be running well. We have no delays on the A1M as yet. Everything running nicely on the M40. And on the trains and tubes, no reported problems. Adam Glynn, BBC Three County Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. Lots coming up in the next hour of the show, including if you would, if you chose to opt out of donating your organs after you died. Well, I just can't understand why anybody would do that. Here's Catherine on FM, AM, online, and digital radio. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, it's seven o'clock. The headlines, child protection groups call for online clampdown, council acts on high town prostitution and lottery windfall for historic park. BBC Three Counties Radio. The Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre is warning that live images of children being abused are becoming more common online. Experts say families from overseas are often paid to set up access via webcams with organised crime groups sometimes involved. The CEOP Chief Executive Peter Davis says it's an increasing problem. A lot of people might think of indecent images of children as effectively still photographs and the majority of them still are but that's one kind of the offending the other thing we are seeing more of now is video streaming where often images are being streamed live or recently recorded to video standard the council in Luton has given the go-ahead for a special enforcement zone to be created in the town's red light district. Police have been given the power to use dispersal orders on anyone they suspect of antisocial behaviour in Hightown. This even means anyone under the age of 16 years old found in the area after 9pm could be taken home by officers. In the last 14 months, there have been over 600 incidents of antisocial behaviour in Hightown, including curb crawling, drug dealing and intimidation of local residents by young men. Wales is set to become the first part of the UK to presume that people consent to organ donation. If passed, the policy will mean anyone over 18 is an organ donor unless they state it otherwise. But the Archbishop of Wales, Barry Morgan, says it's a dangerous move. Just imagine if your distressed relatives, you've been at the bedside of a dying person for three or four days, it's not clear what the wishes are, but you don't want organ removed. Then to have legislation that says they can be removed, I think, is counterproductive and might result in more people opting out. After more than a week living in Moscow Airport, the American fugitive Edward Snowden has revealed he's asked 21 countries for asylum. The list includes Russia, Bolivia and Ireland, but not the UK. He's wanted in the United States for leaking classified information about the country's surveillance programme. A senior MP is warning that the current timetable for building the high-speed two rail line through the Chilterns is complete madness. Labour's Margaret Hodge, who chairs the Commons Public Accounts Committee, said it's unrealistic. Milton Keynes has a disproportionate number of people receiving injuries as a result of falling over. That's according to a new report from the council. Tony Fisher has the details. Older people are at the greatest risk of falling and of suffering a permanent injury. Over the coming years, Milton Keynes expected to have a significant rise in the number of older people. As a result, the council set up a falls prevention strategy and implementation group comprising several organisations. It says clear targets will be set to bring down the amount of falls in the new city. 
In sport, Australia's rugby union captain James Horwell has been cleared to play in Saturday's deciding third test against the British and Irish Lions. The International Rugby Board's appeal against the decision to clear Horwell of stamping on Alan Wynne-Jones in the first test has been turned down. The weather mostly dry with sunny spells and a top temperature of 19 degrees Celsius. That's 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Lots to talk about. I'll give you the ways you can get in touch in a few seconds. First of all, a new system of organ donation, which assumes anyone over 18 has agreed to be a donor unless they've stated otherwise, could be voted through in Wales later. Well, who on earth would opt out of an organ donation scheme? I can't think of anybody that would. Have men only clubs had their day? Watford Round Table could be forced to close its doors after 77 years. Numbers have dwindled to just seven members. And it seems that Stevenage is worried about giant hogweed. We'll find out what's going on later. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can send me a text 81333. Start your text 3CR. Or you can give me a call 08459 455 555. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. That is a rather unpleasant story. The number of images of child abuse online is growing dramatically. That's according to a report today from police experts. Last year, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre, or CEOP, said it had 8,000 reports of indecent images being shared, 70,000 images in total, which was double the number of previous years. Technology is also playing a greater role in abuse too. Well, I'm joined now by Chief Executive of the National Association of People Abused in Childhood. Uh, That's Peter Saunders. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Ian. Obviously very worrying, but is part of your concern that the authorities... Well, they seem to be a step behind on this, don't they? Well, on on the new technology, you mean, Ian? Well, absolutely. And uh, abusers, perpetrators of abuse, have always been very adept at keeping one step ahead of detection and authority. So I think it's a good wake-up call to the nation that we need to do more to prevent this vile crime we certainly need to invest more in our policing and CEOP particularly so that these kind of crimes can be investigated and at NAPAC as as I think we've discussed before every day we hear from the the victim survivors about the devastating consequences of these vile crimes so I think in the wake of the the, the Jimmy Savile sort of wake-up call if you like to what is going on to our children in this country um, the CEOP report, which I've, I've just looked at earlier, is yet another sad indication of, of, of how much work we've got ahead uh, to do to, to protect our children, Ian. If we're constantly behind, uh, you know, the, the idiots that, that, that are doing these crimes in terms of technology, yeah. is it a losing battle? Um, I don't think it is. Um, I'm not saying we I, should give up. But I'm, no, I'm no, just no, asking absolutely. if it's a losing battle. No. Well, gosh, no, I, c- I could never say that. Of course not. Our children are far too precious mm. to, to, to give up on. Um, uh, it, it's, gonna, it's a hard battle. We're in a, we're in a war. It's not a battle. It's a war. Um, there are, you know, most children in our society, thank God, grow up safe and sound. But a significant number are, are, are suffer abuse, and there are a lot of perpetrators in society. And, and there are many things, and we haven't got time to discuss it now, but there are many things that we could do that are far better, more effective ways of, of, of protecting our children. Give me a couple, Peter. Give me a couple of suggestions of things that we, we, we could be doing differently. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, yes, mandatory reporting is an absolute essential. Where abuse occurs in institutions like schools, etc., we're thinking of Jer- Jeremy Forrest conviction a couple of weeks ago. If, if if abuse is witnessed by a colleague, then there shouldn't be a case of do I, don't I report this. We should all be whistleblowers and obligatory whistleblowers when it comes to child abuse. I'm not talking about other areas of life, but children only get one chance of life. If we see somebody abusing a child, 
particularly in an institution where we can legislate, then make it compulsory. Not, uh, not, not do I, don't I, but make it compulsory that that incident is reported to the authorities. That is one thing that the government could legislate on tomorrow. There's no question of that. Gove could legislate for schools tomorrow. The other thing I think, and perhaps the, um, the more difficult one to, to get our heads around, is that children spend 180 days a year in school Schools probably are the place where we need to equip our children and educate our children to really look after themselves because although most parents do a good job, many don't and it's schooling where they need to learn respect uh, about life, Mm. about responsibility uh, and if you get children at an early age with those things in mind, then, you know, because all abusers, remember, Ian, start off as kids, don't they? I mean, obviously, by definition, we all start our life as children. If we can educate our children about respect for one another, etc., etc., then they're far less likely to get drawn into the kind of nasty world of, of abuse. And most abuse, as we know at NAPAC every day we hear, occurs in the home, hence the need for far more education around this area we uh, i read a figure an hour ago on the show peter and is this true that the, the one in every 58 children in the uk will suffer some form of sexual abuse before they reach 18 oh my gosh ian that is a that 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 is more, less than the tip of the iceberg really that 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 is the oh dear. that is the statistic that seop have come up with around the number of children who will be abused by non-related individuals The NSPCC, our colleagues at NSPCC, their most recent research, and as I say, this is not NAPAC research, this is NSPCC who have a lot of resources, they put a lot of effort into this work. Their latest estimate is that 25% or one in four children in this country will suffer some form of se- sexual abuse really? during their lifetime. Well, isn't that depressing? It, it, it's more than depressing. Yeah. But talking about it as we are, airing it in the media as we are, is a massive, massive step because we wouldn't have been having this conversation 10 years ago, Ian, would we? No, we wouldn't. And uh, I find that figure is incredible. Peter, I appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much. Have a good day, Ian. Here we go. So, uh, Peter Saunders. Chief Executive of the National Association of People Abused in Childhood. I thought one in 58 was high. That's one in four. Flipping it. What is... What is going on? 08459 four double five five double five is the phone number. Moving on, Wales is likely to become the first country in the UK to introduce a system of presumed consent for organ donation today. If passed, the new law will mean people need to opt out rather than opt in to the organ donor register. Well, our reporter Sophie Solaria has been to find out what you think, and she asked, should organ donation be compulsory unless you opt out? Uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. I don't need them anymore, do I? As long as they're healthy, are going. Yeah, it gives them lots of chance. In I suppose you're locked in. Don't really matter to you when you're gone, does it? If it does someone else a favour, then it's it's good, isn't it? Like, really, when you die, unless they can't use them, they should be able to use them. I think it should be net like mandatory, really. Like, I suppose people religiously will believe strongly against it. However, I just don't think it's not necessary to have the organs when you're dead, is it? And someone else might not die because they could use yours. Would you opt out? No, because I'm already a donor, so I would opt in. wouldn't really make any difference to me. I'll be dead. Well, so the people that uh, Sophie spoke to were happy to donate organs. It turns out some people aren't that happy. If you're one of them, do give me a call 08459 455 555. We can speak to Professor John Faber, an organ donation expert at King's College London. Where do you stand on presumed consent, John? Uh, I'm opposed to the idea. Um, It's a very simple idea that sounds wonderful, but um, it actually won't deliver the extra organs every, everyone thinks it will do. Why, why not? Where's the flaw in the system? The flaw is that um, the whole organ donation process is quite complex and you can't start legislating for consent the way Wales is, is planning to do. Consent's a crucial issue and only about 60% of families in the UK are consent to donation, whereas countries like Spain, it's more like 85% cons- consent to donation. But the way to tackle that isn't to legislate for consent. Um, but to do what the Spanish have done and to go forward with good public relations, good public education, very professional approaches to the family, that sort of thing. It, it does seem um, uh, slightly selfish to not uh, allow a loved one's organs to be used to save someone's life, doesn't it? 
It is, but you have to consider... Uh, obviously, we all want more donors, don't we? Yeah. Um, and But we can't simply take organs from people. Some of the respondents um, to your questions um, a few minutes ago were saying that it should be compulsory. Uh, yes, take the organs. But, you know, this is a, a, a very difficult situation where a loved one suddenly is in an intensive care unit and is dying. And you can't... The state can't simply intervene there and, and take organs in that in that context. You have to take the population with you. The population has to be in favour. Um, the family has to be uh, involved in the, in the decision-making process. It's not as simple as, you know, um, just whipping in and taking organs out. But if those families aren't in favour, if the population aren't in favour, aren't they selfish? To me, it seems common. Well, it, it just seems obvious. It's, to, to, it's to obvious, isn't it? And, it's, and, and every donor saves uh, several lives. Mm. It's... Um, uh, it's every, every wasted donor is, is a tragedy. But you, you have to try and consider the context in which organ donation occurs. And, um, and they, it, it's probably a mixture of um, um, families not knowing what's, what's happening with organ donation, fear that the person isn't dead, and all that sort of um, uh, thing, which needs to be addressed mm. um, in a much more... Um, considered fashion than simply legislating for consent. Do you think the legislation that's being discussed in Wales could be counterproductive, that, that by forcing things in Wales it could turn many more people against transplants? It's, it's possible. I personally don't think that will be a big issue. I just, I just don't think that the that transplantation in Wales should go forward on this um, in this rather crude way. John, I appreciate your time this morning. That's uh, Professor John Faber. He's an organ donation expert at King's College London. Well, what do you think? 08459 four double five five double five. Should organ donation be compulsory? You'd have to opt out of it. Um, let's have a quick some, some of your comments on Facebook. Warren says, I think an opt-out system is a good idea, but surely there's other legal boundaries to cover too. With the current opt-in system, can't close family members overrule. Uh, Nettie says, I do think it's a good idea. I think it makes it easier. I'm an organ donation participant. Uh, through death, someone else might get a chance to live. To me, that's great. Uh, Mark says, the question I have is, how do you opt out? And Shirley says, not against the idea. However, having had cancer, I'm not allowed to donate blood anymore. Presume all the tests would have to be done. Well, they do test you, don't they? Make sure you haven't got any, you haven't got the lurgy or anything before they, you know, they wouldn't put an, an untested kidney uh, in someone that wanted it. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. I'd love to talk to you. This could be a little bit tricky. I appreciate that. But if uh, you or someone you love has received an organ and has lived because of it, give me a call. Or if you've lost a loved one and uh, just after they died, a doctor came in and said, well, if uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on organ donation. If you had to give... Uh, the, uh, loved one's organs away or refuse to. Could you give me a call? 08459 four double five five double five. Right, 716. Travel News, Adam Glynn. Travel News for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Thanks, Ian. M1 southbound looking slow from the Luton Airport junction, junction 10, down toward Redbourne at junction 9 for the A5. That's being picked up by the speed sensors there. Looks like not a massive queue, a short queue starting to form along that stretch. Really, the rest of the M1's looking fine. No delays yet on the A1M. It's looking pretty OK past Stevenage still. And the M40 is running well to and from London. But the M25 is slowing up in a few spots. Anti-clockwise, the delays now start back at the M11 in Essex. Junction 27, round to 25 at Enfield, so into the roadworks from there. Then from the M1 to Kings Langley, Junction 21 to 20. And from Watford to the M40, Junction 19 to 16. And if you're driving in toward London on the A1 through Boreham Wood, you've got queues as you come from Stirling Corner down toward Mill Hill Circus. Train departure boards showing no problems, nothing running more than a couple of minutes late, and there are no issues reported for the tubes. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. Right, 7.17. It's Tuesday, the 2nd of July. I'm wearing a short-sleeved shirt, and these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. The Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre is warning that live images of children being abused are becoming more common online. Luton Borough Council will use dispersal orders to crack down on prostitution and drug abuse in Hightown. 
In sport, James Horwell is available to captain Australia in Sydney's test match against the British and Irish Lions after being cleared of stamping on Alan Wynne-Jones in the first test in Brisbane. The weather today for beds, hearts and bucks, mostly dry with sunny spells and a top temperature of 19 degrees. Coming up, as of today, the airline EasyJet has changed the rules for cabin baggage. They've made it bigger. I'm only joking, they've made it significantly smaller. BBC Three Counties Radio. Every weekday from three, Roberto Peroni. The bosses of a Milton Keynes lorry driver who died after falling asleep at the wheel have been found guilty of manslaughter with the best local news stories. At the moment, Christmas in Luton is at risk. We'll do our best. We'll work with the, the business community and other sponsors to find the Christmas lights. The best local travel. Multi-vehicle crash on the M1 northbound just as you come from the M25. It's going to get busy. Three cars involved with the best local talking points. Because I was born female, that was my first sin if you like and I don't think I've ever been forgiven for it. Roberto Peroni weekdays from three on BBC Three Counties Radio. Shall we have a look at the front pages of the newspapers? Yes let's let's do it at a leisurely pace as well shall we? We were rushing all over the place this morning. Let's just let's just calm down a little bit shall we? By the way the rabbit's doing very well. Thank you for asking. The rabbit's doing excellently. Although we kind of a gardening tip this morning with the hogweed if you've ever had an encounter with hogweed, 08459 four double five five double five. My uh, um, um, broccoli is overrun with caterpillars, like hundreds of caterpillars, to the point where even I turned over a, a new leaf and went, oh, I took a step back. Though It was covered in caterpillars. Horrible. And I'm not that squeamish around caterpillars. I can dig caterpillars. I, not these ones. Is this common? Is this a phenomenon that's happening at the moment? Caterpillar infestation. Well, let's see if it's on the front page of the papers. Oh, wait, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five. The uh, Independent. Egypt in crisis. Army gives president 48 hours. Will they make up their mind over there? This fella's only been in power a year. You, you kicked out the last fella. You voted for this one, and now it's all kicking off again. I don't quite understand what's going on. They're not happy with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. But hang on a minute. This is what... You campaigned about a few years ago to get rid of that other fella. Then you voted in this fella. I'm I'm obviously... Listen, listen, I don't don't claim to know what's going on in Egypt. I'm obviously missing something. But but if someone could uh, explain it to me. Uh, Education for sale, says the Independent. Gove plans to let firms run schools for profit. Oh, that's going to be a great idea, isn't it? Academies and free schools should become profit-making businesses that use hedge funds and venture capitalists to raise money, according to private plans being drawn up by the Education Secretary, Michael Gove. Yes, because hedge funds and venture capitalism, that never lets people down, does it? That's always successful. There's all, that, that's always a guaranteed investment. Um, now Snowden asks Russia for asylum Edward Snowden, isn't he living it's going to make an amazing film who's going to play Edward Snowden in a film is it da- Damien Lewis is he the gentleman, he's good isn't he he's English isn't he, but we all think he's American he, da- Damien Lewis could play Snowden in a film and carry it off who was it who played um, the bloke who broke bearings um, Nick, Nick, Nick um Nick, I'm going to say some surnames till the right one comes. This could be a while. Nick Rogers? No. Nick Burbank? Nick Lewis? Nick... I'm getting closer. Nick uh, Lincoln? Nick... Nick Leeson! I knew I was getting closer. Producer Tara told me the answer, but I was. I got there. My, um, OK, so we've established who he was. Who was the actor that played him? It was um, the bloke who was in the, the new Star Wars films. Anyway. That was a boring film. That's the point I'm trying to get to. Uh, the Guardian. Listen to people or else. Egyptian armies 48... You and McGregor. Egyptian armies 48-hour ultimatum. Egypt was thrown into fresh turmoil last night when President Mohamed Morsi's aides indicated he would not give in to the threat of a military coup. Obama scrambles to limit crisis amid... Uh, uh, oh, this is a great one. This is a great one. Obama scrambles to limit crisis amid EU outrage over bugging. Merkel and Hollande want answer. So it's come out America has been bugging Europe. Who'd have thought it? What a surprise. But now Angela Merkel and uh, Francois Hollande uh, have said they're going to pull out of negotiations for trade deals with the US. Yeah, that's a great idea, guys. 
Because you knew they were bugging us. We've all seen films. They're always bugging us, aren't they? 08459 455 555. We'll do uh, the rest of the papers. I'm a couple of papers short, but we'll do the rest of the papers uh, in a little bit. Because here's an important story. If you're off on your holidays with EasyJet this summer, well, you better pack lighter as of today. The airline has changed the rules for cabin baggage. Instead of measuring the weight of your bag, you'll be checked in according to size, and the size is now smaller. If you get it wrong, guess what? You will have to pay. But with us now is marketing director for EasyJet, Peter Duffy. Peter, explain exactly what the difference is. Uh, well, that's not quite true, Ian. Um, there's been no change to our cabin, bo- uh, cabin baggage policy. Uh, the size of the bag today. is smaller, isn't it? No, you can still bring your bag up to 56, 45, 25. But you might have to pay more for it. Not at all, no. Well, let's, um, let's hear the difference then. Uh, so um, what happens is on certain of our busier flights, if everybody brings a bag of that size, then we simply can't fit them all into the cabin. So we have to take some of them and put them in the hold. We do that free of charge. OK. But if you're planning to use the things in your bag, perhaps uh, their valuables or electronic equipment you want to use on a flight, that can be really irritating for customers. So what we're saying is, if you know that you want to use the things during the flight and you want to guarantee that bag stays with you, then the one way to do that is to bring a slightly smaller bag of 50, 40, 20. Um, So we'll still bring, except the bigger bags, and there'll be no change to that policy at all. Uh, But just if you want to travel with it, absolutely, and be really sure that it can't be taken off you at the gate, then then that's the thing to do. So, and and there will be no charge for putting that bag into the hold? Not if it's up to our maximum size of 56, 45, 25, which is one of the most generous sizes in the industry. And you can still take another suitcase as well? And you can put a bag in the hold as normal, yeah. So you can have two bags in the hold? You can put bags in the hold and you can have that cabin bag with you as well. Well, there there we go. That's, that's, uh, That's the end of that story then. So we were sold a pup there, I believe. Thank you very much, Peter. So not much of a change at all. I wouldn't bother typing that question. He's gone. No story there whatsoever. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sorting that one out. Whoever booked that, you're fired. Back to the front page of the newspapers. Can you tell? Can you tell I'm not happy? I'm not happy. Sold a pup. But listen, if you're going to put a story in the, the show, research it. Thanks very much. Right. The Daily Telegraph. Uh, scandal of doctors paid more to do less. What? Nonsensical labour contract gave senior medics time off on a 28% pay rise. Senior hospital doctors have received pay rises of up to 28% following the introduction of a nonsensical contract that allows them to refuse to work in the evenings and at weekends. A report warns today. There's a lot of um, uh, flack, I believe is the word, being aimed at doctors at the moment... Do you think this is this is a government sabotage to try and uh, upset them? I think doctors, for the most part, there are some idiots, let's be honest. And who knows what happened in that doctor's surgery in Milton Keynes. We've heard rumours. We'll get to the bottom of it. But most doctors, most doctors are pretty good, all things considered. I don't think they get paid enough. I don't want to get more abuse on, on Twitter and Facebook. You idiot. Go and live in the real world. You earn more than politicians. <laughs> Not on this job, I don't. But I don't think doctors get paid enough. Doctors save lives. They save lives. Don't raise an eyebrow at me. They save lives. What do we do? What do you do? I present a radio show. It's not that important, is it? Really, in the great scheme of things. Six-week school holidays under threat as heads get new powers. Oh, for goodness sakes. The Daily Mail. Andy Murray has won a tennis match. That girl we were all talking about, whose name we've already forgotten, has not won a tennis match. Who was she? I don't know. Remember that girl that was quite good at tennis? No. £10 test predicts the baby blues. British scientists hail breakthrough for mothers-to-be. But there is a story on the front, page 26. Are your tea bags destroying the planet? No. Page 26 does not agree. We turn to page 26. The new enemy of the planet, your tea bags. Oh, for goodness sake. Some environmental activists get worked up about rainforests. Others worry about the plight of polar bears or the peril of rising sea, uh, sea levels. But for Diana Fox Carney, economist, green guru and wife of the new governor of the Bank of England, the issue that gets her really, really hot under the collar is the humble tea bag. She describes the leaf field sachets as one of her pet hates and says, yes, they are an environmental disaster. You are joking, aren't you? You are joking. It's tea bags! 
Yes, they can be pretty and convenient, she says on her blog, but do we really need an extra 40 centimetres squared of bleached and printed paper with every cup of tea? Yes, we do. It's a cup of... It's a tea bag. Not getting rid of that, love. The Daily Express. Free banking to be scrapped. Meddling EU's plan will send charges soaring. And the sun... Wow, this is the front page of the sun. Have you seen this? Ramadama ding dong. Ramadama ding dong. Muslim call to prayer on TV. Shock horror. Channel 4's daily broadcast. Stunt could inflame tension. This is the Channel 4 stunt. Channel 4 yesterday revealed it will broadcast the Islamic call to prayer every morning during the holy month of Ramadan. Shows will be interrupted for the chant. Last night, Channel 4 was accused of a cynical publicity stunt which could inflame community tensions. Uh, how? How is that going to inflame community tensions? I would suggest the front page, Ramadama Ding Dong, could inflame more community tensions than Channel 4 playing the call to prayer for a month. I, I don't know. What do you think? Quick straw poll, dear listener. Are you inflamed by Channel 4 playing the call to prayer twice a day for a month? Or are you more upset by the headline Ramadama Ding Dong? Although it is quite fun to say, if I'm completely honest. Rolls off the tongue. 08459 four double five five double five, Or send me a text, 81333. Start your text, 3CR. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. It's a bit like saying you're enraged by songs of praise. The A1, as you come into London through Boreham Wood, southbound Stirling Corner to Mill Hill Circus, is looking very slow. You've got delays on the anti-clockwise M25, stop-start traffic from the M11 through to Potter's Bar into the roadworks. It's also busy anti-clockwise from the M1 to Kings Langley and Watford to the M40. That's pretty much one big stretch of traffic now. Southbound M1, looking slow from the Luton Airport Spur around Junction 10 toward Redbourne at Junction 9. And problems if you're heading a bit further north on the M1. We've got queuing traffic. It is partially blocked by an accident between Junction 15A at Toaster and 16 at Daventry. So if you're heading up toward Northamptonshire this morning, it's looking slow through there. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Adam. Coming up to 7.30, news and sport now with Catherine. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Radio. Good morning. The headlines. The Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre is warning that live images of children being abused are becoming more common online. Luton Borough Council will use dispersal orders to crack down on prostitution and drug abuse in High Town. And Wales is set to become the first part of the UK to presume that people consent to organ donation. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. Andy Murray will play Fernando Vadasco in the last eight of Wimbledon after his straight sets win over Mikhail Yuzhny. Today it's women's quarter-finals day and the draw features a number of lesser-known names as our correspondent Jonathan Overend reports. Well, it's a completely unexpected lineup. Agnieszka Radvanska at four is the highest seed left and she reached the final last year. Marion Bartley has also played the final and, of course, Petra Kvitova has won it. There's Lina, who's played the Australian Open final and won the French... And then four new names, Sabine Lezicki, who upset Williams so spectacularly yesterday, Kaya Kanepi, who beat Laura Robson, Kirsten Flipkins of Belgium, who's been mentored by Kim Clijsters, and perhaps the most interesting prospect of the eight, Sloane Stevens, the young American, who could be the one to watch over the next few days. Australian captain James Horwell has been cleared to play in Saturday's third and deciding rugby union test against the British and Irish Lions. The news comes after the International Rugby Board's appeal against the decision to clear him of stamping in the first test was turned down. Olympic long jump champion Greg Rutherford has been responding to criticism of his form since London last year. The Woburn Sands-based athlete finished second at the Diamond League meeting in Birmingham at the weekend, but says he's not still fully fit due to fluid on the knee. It's just about trying to stimulate my body to, to remove it, but for whatever reason, it's been really persistent and won't go. And the issue has been with that, if you look at my jumps technically at the moment, I'm not able to do the lateral step that I was doing so well last year that was helping me jump so far. And I'm having to revert back to something that I'm not comfortable with. And that's the latest news and sports. I'll be back with more at eight o'clock. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. There's a distinct smell of cat urine in this studio. Has there been a cat in here? 
I have a cat. I can definitely smell cat wee. It's 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 a very for those cat owners whose cats have peed in the. No, it's not me. Uh, whose cats have peed near them? It's a very acidic scent, isn't it? it it's a very distinct acidic scent, and that's what I'm getting in this studio. Is there a cat in here? Something odd. Ah, right. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Coming up in the next 30 minutes of the show, the uh, d- d- Watford Round Table may have to close. It's down to seven members. Well, are these men-only groups? Are they a little bit old-fashioned? And surely it makes absolute perfect sense to have an opt-out system when it comes to organ transplantation. I can't, I can't think anybody would disagree with that. When you die... Unless you've said otherwise, everything is up for grabs. Your heart, your kidney, your lungs, your eyes, everything. Yes, even that. 08459 four do- Yes. 08459 four double five five double five. It's amazing what they can do with prosthetics these days. Now, hogweed. Oh, Stevenage Town is being plagued by a dangerous plant. Local resident, Pete Perry, has complained about the highly toxic illegal giant hogweed, which is growing around the North Hearts College. Despite persistently telling the police, the environmental health and the council, the problem is getting worse. As he explained to our reporter, hogweed correspondent, Serena Farrow. So, Pete, here we are, we're outside Asda, which yeah. is near to where this horrid stuff is. It is indeed, yes. Yeah. North Hearts College is right opposite Asda. We've got quite a few students here, so yes. w- would it be harmful to them? We've only got to brush it and there's small hairs which actually secrete a poison, an irritant, rather harmful. It can be very, very painful. And as far as you're concerned, tell us when was the first time you complained? Way back in 75, this is what highlighted it. A boy from Stevenage actually got hospitalised for seven years with this rash. So it's pretty serious. If you just cut it down, which the council has done before, it'll keep growing because the roots will keep growing. And then the seeds, very often they cut it down after it's flowered. The seed then will stay in the ground for four or five years before it starts coming up and flowering again and starts the cycle. We've come to the front of the college and round to the side. The the college authorities have put a hedge along here to stop people get out at it. You know, so maybe it'd be better to go into that part there. Yeah. So we've got round the other side now and we have found that they have actually cordoned it off with a fence. But the thing is, Serena, don't forget that a kid could climb over there and get into it. Really, I don't think fencing it off is really going to cut it, to be honest. Well, I suppose because it's across from McDonald's, isn't it? So I suppose there are going to be young people hanging around and people in the area. Describe what this weed looks like. Cow parsley. And even, you know, you get forms of it in the garden which, with pretty coloured flowers on top, umbrella flowers a lot of people call them. It is umbrella but white, these are creamy white aren't yeah, these they? These are creamy white and they can grow up to ten feet tall right. so you can't miss them really it's like a giant cow parsley. And well it's like a little mini um, umbrella as well isn't it? It kind it of is. stalks up Green That's right, stalk. it is. It's what they call an umbelliferous plant, which is, means umbrella-like. The flowers all grow on a stalk like an umbrella, but they look lovely from a distance. Well, that was Pete Perry speaking to our reporter, Serena Farrow. Dr Ian Denham from the uh, University of Hertfordshire is the new president of the Botanical Society, a Society of the British Isles. Joins me now. Morning, Ian. Good morning. What exactly is this giant hogweed? I've never heard of it before. Well, it is, as we've heard, it's a member of the Umbellifer family, like, a bit like a giant cow parsley, very, very imposing. Uh, it's not native to Britain, it's native to the mountain range between Russia and Turkey, and it was planted firstly in the 19th century, mostly in stately homes around uh, ornamental ponds, for example, because that's the sort of habitat it likes. And how harmful is it? What does it do? Well, there are two problems associated with it. One is it can escape and establish itself, and it does particularly like to do so along watercourses. And when it does that, it produces copious seed, and these seeds can move downstream and uh, cause a rapid spread. And and where it's established, giant hogweed can pretty much outcompete any other native plant present. So there's there's an ecological risk. So should people be worried of it? Um, Well, the other concern that's much more widely publicised is is the health risk. And um, as the gentleman who, who spoke before said... Uh, the sap of this species contains chemicals which are technically called furanocumarins, which can sensitise the skin, leading to photodermatitis. In other words, subsequent exposure to sunlight can cause very bad burning and blistering. 
Um, Ouch, it sounds very unpleasant. It, it, the area in Stevenage where it's growing, it's been fenced off. Is that enough? Well, it's very difficult to comment without knowing uh, the location. It's, the risk assessment would very much deter- be determined by the likelihood of access and um, members of the public encountering the plants. You have to encounter them physically for the damage to occur. Uh, and uh, could, it, could it spread to people's gardens? It produces very, very large number of seed, um, and potentially, yes, it can, it can turn up anywhere. Um, and what do, you do, what do you do to control it, Ian? Well, theoretically, it can be dug up, but that's quite a laborious task, yeah. um, and it depends how easy it is to access. The can you burn it? The, having dug it up, yes, certainly. Right. Uh, but the most efficient way is to uh, apply herbicide. And that, no- that knocks it out, does it? That, that can take it out quite efficiently, yes. Uh, but, with, with, uh, but it does have this seed bank, and uh, you can't necessarily solve the problem in a single year. One quick question while I've got a botanical uh, expert on. My um, son has been growing broccoli. I-, I turned out there are hundreds of caterpillars on there, Ian. What on earth's going on? Well, um, that's probably... Uh, well, those will be the larvae of one of the moths that uh, favour... Mm. I've never crops. seen um, so many, though. It was quite horrible. Do you see a lot of feeding damage? Yeah, yeah a lot of feeding damage. They've ruined my blooming broccolis. <laughs> yes. Obviously, uh, the, the level of these infestations can vary from year to year, depending on climatic conditions. Okay. And it looks as though you've got a bad attack. I've got a bad attack. They've not touched my sweet peas yet, though, which is something. If they do, oh, there'll be trouble. Dr Ian Denham from the University of Hertfordshire, thank you very much indeed. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, uh, 08459 455 555 is the phone number. Are you happy for your organs to be donated after you die? I cannot think of one possible reason why you would not want to donate your organs when you're dead. I can't think of one. You're dead. You won't know. If you've ever seen a dead body, okay, you'll know that's not that's not Nan or Del or Dad or that's not Mum in there. It's just a it's just a shell. The person you knew isn't in there. It's just a husk. So why wouldn't what you want to use it to help somebody else? If somebody can call me up, religious or otherwise, with a good reason why you wouldn't want to donate your bits of your body to save someone else's life, oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Maybe you've been in the situation where you've lost someone. A doctor's come in and said, well, um, uh, we believe that Stephen was a donor. No, you're not having any of it. Well, uh, we do have somebody who could benefit from Stephen's cornea. No, you're not touching him. Or maybe the opposite situation. You've, be, you've been in there and uh, doctors come in and asked for a, your, your son or your mum or your dad's liver. And you've gone, yep, of course, help yourself. How difficult was that decision to make? Moments after that person had died. 08459 455 555. Well, what do you do if you don't have a donor card and you're not on the organ donor register? Should doctors be allowed to help themselves to your heart or liver or kidney? A new system of organ donation, which presumes consent, unless you've stated otherwise, could be voted through in Wales today. It would make that country the first part of the UK to introduce the controversial idea. Roy Thomas is from the Kidney Wales Foundation. He says the current system just isn't working. Our research has shown that uh, 66% of people believe in this legislation and uh, 90% of people want to give uh, but don't get around to signing the register. Uh, And that's typical of us in society. Uh, People do believe in organ donation. They do give, and it's a tremendous gift of life. Well, around 1,000 people die every year waiting for a donor organ. The Welsh Government reckons the new law could increase the number of organs available in Wales by about a quarter. Martin Griffiths is 36. He needs a new heart, lung and kidney, and he's just waiting for the phone to ring. The old days where I get fed up, I can't be bothered. don't want to go to dialysis. I just want to stay in bed and be left alone. But I know if I don't go for dialysis again, again. Okay, so how would this system work? Well, if you're over 18 and you've lived in Wales for at least 12 months, you'd be considered as a potential donor unless you've specifically opted out. And strictly speaking, families wouldn't have a right to veto that decision, though Welsh ministers say no organs will be taken if families or friends can demonstrate the deceased would have objected. Hang on, how do you do that? That's a tough one to prove. But many are either squeamish about having bits of our body removed or have serious moral objections. Dr Barry Morgan is the Archbishop of Wales. He says organ donation should be a gift of love 
not something ordered by the state. Just imagine if your distressed relatives, you've been at the bedside of a dying person for three or four days, it's not clear what the wishes are, but you don't want organ removed. Then to have legislation that says they can be removed, I think, is counterproductive and might result in more people opting out. I don't agree with that at all. I don't agree with that. I'm trying to think if someone close to me died... It's impossible to put yourself in that situation, isn't it? Uh, but uh, when, when my dad died this year, he was in no fit state to give anything, but I would happily have said, yeah, go on, take what you want, get it, get it, get stuck in there. Surely if it saves someone else's life, that's the thing, isn't it? Well, even if the Welsh Assembly members vote in favour this afternoon, it'll be two years before any changes come into force. The Department of Health in England says the idea of an opt-out system was considered in 2008, but the Organ Donation Task Force... What? advised against it. Critics say it simply adds to the distress of bereaved families, but supporters say it makes no sense to be buried or cremated with all your organs when they could be used to save lives. So this morning, should organ donation be compulsory unless you opt out? I genuinely think there is no argument for not donating your organs. There's no argument. I mean, I guess the most common thing is the emotion of not wanting a loved one cut open. What they do is pretty gross. Okay, You're not going to see it, and they'll do a pretty darn good job of making sure everyone, you know, that things are sewn up and that person looks pretty much as good as new. They can do a lot of things with makeup and stitches. There can be no reason for not donating someone's organs. I'd love to hear from you if you've said no or if you said yes. 08459 four double five five double five you can text as well eight one three double three start your text three yeah got some facebook comments on this ruth says yes everyone should be on the register automatically and it should be opt out and not opt in people can be selfish in their grief and not think of others my sister died and when we made the decision to give her organs it was too late we were able to give corneas though but if the decision had been made already it would have been a lot easier Jenny says, not only should consent be assumed automatically unless someone opts out, family should not be allowed to overrule the deceased's wish. A friend of mine comes from a Jehovah's Witness family, but she does not conform to their beliefs. Despite having registered as a donor herself, her parents would be allowed under the current system to overrule because of their religious beliefs, not hers. 08459 455 555. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Still some problems a bit further north on the M1. If you're heading up toward Northamptonshire, it's partially blocked by an accident between Toaster at Junction 15A and Daventry at Junction 16, and traffic's looking slow. Across the three counties, though, things running really quite well on the roads this morning. We have no major issues on the M1 as you come down toward London. It's running nicely. A little bit of slow traffic from the Luton Airport spur toward Redbourne, Junction 10 to 9. Speed sensors aren't picking up any other major issues. It's all looking quite clear on the A1M. Quite slow on the A414 in Hartford, mainly on the eastbound side as you head toward Ware. Westbound looking a little slow as well. At London Coney and the A414 is looking busy coming toward the Park Street roundabout. No problems for the M40, but the M25, you've got patches of traffic that start back in Essex at the M11. It's stop-start from there through to the roadworks. Potter's Bar at Junction 24 looking busy. Then you've also got queues roughly from the M1 at Junction 21 round to the M40 at Junction 16. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. More from him just before 8 o'clock. Right, 7.46, Tuesday the 2nd of July. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. The Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre is warning that live images of children being abused are becoming more common online. Luton Borough Council will use dispersal orders to crack down on prostitution and drug abuse in Hightown. In sport, James Horwell is available to captain Australia in Saturday's test match against the British and Irish Lions after being cleared of stamping on Alan Wynne-Jones in the first test in Brisbane. What lovely people. Coming up before 8 o'clock, are men-only clubs like the round table a thing of the past? We'll talk about that and more after the weather with Kate Kinsella. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Good morning. We've seen some brightness this morning, but the cloud is filling in the gaps in in the cloud uh, to make it rather a dull picture. Now, we'll get some brightness through the course of the day, increasing risk of maybe a little spot or two of light rain, but to be honest, it's likely to stay predominantly dry through much of the day anyway. Temperatures rising up to around 19 Celsius, 66 degrees in Fahrenheit, but the wind will increase through the afternoon, so becoming quite blowy. Now, overnight, that's when the rain arrives, or later on this evening, actually, and continues through the night. Some of it quite heavy. Good news for gardens. We'll get a bit of a soaking overnight and the minimum temperature down to 12 Celsius, 54 degrees in Fahrenheit. Now this rain will turn back into light patchy, drizzly rain uh, first thing tomorrow morning, but eventually it will dry out and uh, it's an improving picture. Some sunny spells to follow tomorrow afternoon and a maximum temperature of 21 Celsius. Thank you very much. Every weekday from 12, Nick Coffer brings you... Great guests. Julian Clary. Welcome to BBC Three Counties Radio. Legendary Genesis guitarist, Steve Hackett. Supertramp frontman, Roger Hodgson. Carol Decker of Tapao fame joins me now. Great conversations. China in Your Hand is about the fragility of your dreams and that you should be careful what you wish for. Something very addictive about making people laugh is standing on stage and every few seconds getting that hit of of a laugh... Nick Coffer. Weekdays from 12. On BBC Three Counties Radio. So in Wales, it's being debated and may go through that they would have an opt-out system for organ donation. So it would be presumed that everybody wanted to donate their organs unless they opted out. I don't know, maybe they'd carry a a non-organ donation card. It makes absolutely perfect sense to me. Perfect sense. Well, I don't need my heart or my liver or my kidney. I don't drink or smoke. So I don't need those things when, when I'm dead. Just put in that caveat there. I won't be requiring them when I'm uh, prancing around in heaven. <laughs> heaven. Oh. 08459 four double five five double five. Joseph is from Bedford. Morning, Joseph. Hi. What do you think about organ donation? I think it's a good idea. Um, and the simple way to get around it is just to say that if you don't give, don't expect to take. We, now, we had that theory mentioned before. That's not a bad idea, is it? Yes. Uh, so if, if, you don't, if you say, look, you can't have any of my, my organs when I die, then yes. if, if you need them after a car crash or something ridiculous, you can't yes. have any. You can't have any. Yep. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, can, can you see any reason, Joseph, yeah. why people would not want to donate their organs? Well, I've had this chat with a few people, and some think that there is some life after death, and that um, in the other world, they might not have their organs with them. Uh, what? <laughs> that's, that's what some people believe. Some people think. So, if you go, some people think that you might go to heaven, which is a lovely, comforting thought. If, if, if not, not true, not necessarily heaven. Not necessarily heaven. <laughs> okay, but just uh, an afterlife. And if you give your kidneys to help a sick yeah. child in this world, yeah. in the afterlife, yeah. you won't have kidneys. Yeah, that's bonkers, isn't it? Well, I don't know where the idea is coming from, but that's what some people believe. Joseph, I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much. That's bonkers, isn't it? Isn't it? That if you go to, to heaven or whatever your afterlife may be, and boy, oh boy, wouldn't it be nice if such a place existed? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Doesn't. But it'd be nice if it did. It'd be lovely. But if you go to the, your, after, your chosen afterlife, uh, and uh, you, you, uh, you give up your lungs or something, well, you could, you could, you could be... Um, you wouldn't have lungs in heaven. Or if you gave up your corneas, you'd be a blind ghost. I've got to thank Work Experience Ollie. He's writing all my best lines this morning. Thank you, Ollie. 08459 four double five five double five. Now, are men only clubs like the Round Table a thing of the past? Watford Round Table could be forced to close its doors after 77 years uh, uh, of uh, its numbers have dwindled to just seven members. At its peak, it had a staggering 40. Well, the group has raised over half a million pounds for good causes, and past members include the likes of Boris Johnson. Our reporter, Richard Williams, has been to meet some of those involved. I'm Stuart Hart. I'm uh, chairman of Watford Round Table for this year. Uh, We're here tonight uh, because we get together every fortnight to do some social events, and tonight's Top Golf. 
There's a bit of a misconception about uh, Watford Roundtable. Because we're so well known for fundraising, I think people tend to ignore the fact that, or don't know about the fact that we actually are a, very much a social group and that's what it was actually set up for. Fundraising was kind of secondary. We've been going for 77 years and over the time, because we've been quite successful at fundraising, we've uh, estimated we must have um, so handed out to local charities uh, about half a million pounds. I'm Jane Pattinson, I'm the director of Watford Mencap. Watford Mencap and Roundtable have had a very long-term relationship. It started in the 1960s when they actually purchased Table Hall for us, which enabled us to provide social and leisure activities for people with learning disabilities. They um, purchased the building and then within two years they'd raised enough money to actually pay the mortgage off on the building and then when the building was later sold because it had just become a little bit dated and beyond use, the money was actually given to Watford Mencap, so we received around £80,000 to help with our current services. We have 120 staff, 140 volunteers, and our turnover is £2.2 million. But we really rely on people like the Roundtable because we have to fundraise around half a million pounds per year, and local groups like Roundtable really help us to raise that extra money. Reach Out Plus is a charity which has benefited from Watford Roundtable's help. They take disadvantaged children on canal boat trips. Alan Pedder is their waterways manager. The boat we're on today is called Sheldrake 3. Uh, we take young people away via our Enable programme on a supported trip on the canals uh, up to a week long. It helps them with their self-confidence, they learn new skills. Watford Roundtable have been supporters of ours for a great number of years. 25 years ago, they bought one of our first boats called the Fellowship of Watford. Since then, they've made regular donations to us. And the last one of £1,000, which came in recently, has paid for two young people to go on a supported holiday on the canals for a week. Well, I've come out onto the streets of Watford to see if I can stir up a bit of interest. First question, do people even know what Watford Roundtable is? I have absolutely no idea. I haven't got a clue. A round table. I think it's like a secret society kind of rotary club kind of masons, but I'm not too sure. What do you think the target age group is for it of the people who go there? Well, I think it'd probably be ooh, about 40 plus, 40, 50, 60 maybe, something like that. Uh, Mid-20s, uh, late, early 30s. Probably 20s to, 20 to 40. The membership issue is quite frustrating. We're down to about five active members, seven actual members. We do need to get uh, our name out there again uh, and get members in uh, because it would be quite sad for us and the community uh, to lose Roundtable. Richard Williams reporting there. Well, joined now by Marcus Jones, who represents Roundtable nationally. Morning, Marcus. Good morning. There seems to be a lot of myths about what the Roundtable is. I, I, I guess that's part of the problem. People don't know what you are. One of the biggest challenges we always have is um, is getting our name out there. And uh, today with the modern media, um, especially being Facebook, uh, people are getting to know more about us. Uh, and what exactly do you do? For those who are a little bit naive and don't understand it, Marcus, what exactly do you do? Well, the best way I'd, uh, I'd, I'd put ourselves forward, uh, we're a social club with a conscience. Uh, effectively, we are a social club for uh, young men, 18 to 45, and uh, we, get, we get involved with events um, that you really wouldn't normally get up to, such as sledging um, <clears throat> in the summer and such as, um, you know, abseiling off uh, face cliffs and some exciting stuff like golf nights. Um, but on the other side of it, we also do raise money like your, you know, your, your, your new story just now. Now, you say it's for 18 to 45-year-olds primarily. How old are you, Marcus? I'm 42. OK, so you've got another three years. Yes, do, you, do, you, do you have many 18-year-olds there? We, we do have 18-year-olds. And in fact, you know, my stepson is 21 years of age and, and he's joined Roundtable this year. So we are finding that we're appealing to a younger audience. And very importantly for your listeners this morning, anybody under the age of 26 gets the first two years membership free. Oh, that's, uh, now there's a little bo- bonus. How much does it cost after that? Uh, it's £99 a year after that, but as I say, you know, appealing to a younger audience, and we all know money's difficult these days, Yes. Um, two years free, under 26, it's a great kind of advert out there, which we're promoting more and more every day. Uh, Watford has only got seven members, five active yep. members. How many members have you got nationally in England? Uh, we're, just, we're just under the 5,000 members at the moment. 
we're growing. We're growing for the first time in many years, um, which is great. I think that every association out there with membership is always looking for new ways to continue that growth. And I think this morning and listening to, uh, you know, your stories is a great way of promoting what the guys do within the community. Um, so thank you for promoting them. But also, you know, there are clubs all around your locality that really do want to make a difference and add something to the community. Is it men only, Marcus? The round table is uh, men only. It However, we do have sister organisation, which is Lady Circle. And uh, <laughs> they're part of the family of what we do. I say, I don't know if I'd like to come and see a Lady Circle. Uh, <laughs> is that not a little bit outdated, Marcus? Well, no, I, th I think when you look at it, and, and as I say, we do have a sister organisation, Lady Circle. Again, um, yes. You know, you know, 18 to 45-year-old uh, you know, men can come to do what they want to do. They can come and learn new skills. I've certainly learned new skills whilst being part of Roundtable. Um, so it's not outdated. <laughs> it's the formula we've got that does work. But as I say, we can appeal to the ladies with regards to... A lady it's circle. Club that we have, yes. Lady circle. Uh, Marcus, listen, I, I mean, you do do a lot of great work for charity. If, if people want to get involved with you and are curious after hearing us, <coughs> excuse me, this morning, how, how can they get in touch? Uh, quite simply, go on to our national website, roundtable.co.uk, and especially for the guys, Watford Roundtable, um, go on to their website and their Facebook, um, and you can see all the good work that everybody's doing around the UK. And if, if anybody wanted to um, have a look at a lady circle, what would they do? Uh, same, Lady same. Circle, yeah, exactly. Same. Go on to their website, ladycircle.co.uk. See the website, and there's a uh, there's an email there and co a connection for numbers to get hold of for the membership. Marcus, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Marcus Jones, representing the Round Table and the new organisation I've heard about, the Lady Circle. Travel news for beds, cards, and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Heavy traffic on the M25 at the moment. Clockwise, it's looking slow into the roadworks section. Anti-clockwise, pretty busy through the works as well, with queues tailing back into Essex. It's looking slow as you continue your way around the M25 anti-clockwise as well. And if you're going to be heading as far as the M40, it's pretty much slow from roughly Junction 21 at the M1 down to the M40 at Junction 16. It's not solid queuing traffic, but you've got lots of patches of slow-moving traffic stretches there. Look at the A414, it's uh, quite busy at the moment as you go through London Coney. It's also looking slow in Hartford. As for the 404, that's looking slow on the sensors as you come from High Wycombe down through Marlow and off toward the M4. Trains, a couple of issues. London Midland, 15 minute delays. Euston to Milton Keynes Central. This is a signalling problem at North Wembley. Virgin affected as well. Possibly delays of up to half an hour. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. Someone who's... I can't do a line about Lady Circles, I'm sorry. On FM, AM, online and digital radio. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, it's eight o'clock. I'm Catherine Boyle. The headlines, online child abuse on the increase, dispersal order for Luton's high town and lottery windfall for Historic Park. BBC Three Counties Radio. Child protection experts say live footage of children being sexually abused is increasingly available on the internet. The Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre also estimates that around 50,000 people in the UK are involved in downloading and transferring images of abuse. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Danny Shaw. Last year, SEOP received reports relating to 70,000 indecent videos and still images of children being shared on the internet, double the number the year before. One significant emerging problem is of sexual abuse being streamed live on services such as Skype. Experts say vulnerable families from overseas are paid to set up access to children via webcams, with organised crime groups sometimes involved. SEOP says it's also particularly concerned about the growing use of encrypted computer networks known as the hidden internet to store and send indecent material because it makes it harder to trace abusers. The Welsh Assembly will vote today on whether to introduce presumed consent for organ donation. Ministers believe the change could result in a 25% increase in the number of transplant operations. The council in Luton has given the go-ahead for a special enforcement zone to be created in an area of the town blighted by prostitution. In the last 14 months, there have been over 600 incidents of antisocial behaviour reported in High Town, including curb crawling, drug dealing and intimidation of local residents by young men. Police have been given the power to order anyone they suspect of antisocial behaviour to leave the area. 
A senior MP is warning that the current timetable for building the high-speed two-rail line through Buckinghamshire is complete madness. Labour's Margaret Hodge, who chairs the Commons Public Accounts Committee, says it's unrealistic, and her views are echoed by Joe Rukin from the Stop HS2 campaign. When you're getting that sort of criticism, and you're getting criticism from all of these independent bodies, all the independent economists, all the independent environment, environmentalists, eventually they are going to have to listen. Milton Keynes has a disproportionate number of people being injured as a result of falling over. That's according to the council, which has set up a falls prevention strategy and implementation group in a bid to buck the trend. Houghton Regis's Houghton Hall Park is set for a facelift thanks to a cash windfall from the Heritage Lottery Fund. The council hopes the restoration, which will involve the creation of a working kitchen garden and formal garden, will boost community pride. In sport, James Horwell's available to Captain Australia in Saturday's third and deciding test match against the British and Irish Lions after being cleared of stamping on Alan Wynne-Jones in the first test in Brisbane. The independent appeal officer, Graham Mew, dismissed the International Rugby Board's appeal against the original decision to clear Horwell. In the weather, mostly dry with sunny spells and a top temperature of 19 degrees Celsius, that's 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Get the latest news and sport online at bbc.co.uk slash three counties. You don't know how lightly you got off in the introduction to the news, Catherine. I think I do. OK. BBC Three Counties Radio. That wasn't the right bed, but it certainly makes it gives me more room to talk, doesn't it? Problems with our computers. Don't worry, I'm going to chuck them out and uh, I'm going to see if I can buy a Commodore 64 uh, on eBay for about ten pounds and uh, replace the system we use here because I, I think it would be much more effective. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Lots coming up between now and JVS at nine o'clock, including a new system of organ donation which assumes anyone over 18 has agreed to be a donor unless they've stated otherwise could be voted through in Wales later. Who on earth would opt out of an organ donation scheme? There are people out there who would, you've not called in yet 08459 455 555 have men only clubs had their day? Watford Round Table could be forced to close its door after 77 years. Numbers have dwindled to, to just five active members. And it seems Stevenage is worried about giant hogweed. Yay! We'll find out what's going on later. Why are people falling over in Milton Keynes more than anywhere else? That's a, that's a mystery, isn't it? I'm scared to go. Is it particularly slippy there, or is just everyone a bit, a bit clumsy? Who knows? We'll investigate that and um, keep it to ourselves. Now, Wales is likely to become the first country in the United Kingdom to introduce a system of presumed consent for organ donation today. If passed, the new law will mean people need to opt out rather than opt in to the organ donor donor register. Earlier, our reporter Sophie Solaria went out to find what you think and asked, should organ donation be compulsory unless you opt out? Uh, Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a good idea. I don't need them anymore, do I? As long as they're healthy organ. Yeah, it gives them lots of chance. I suppose you'd opt in, don't really matter to you when you're gone, does it? If it does someone else a favour, then it's, it's good, isn't it? Like, really, when you die... Unless they can't use them, they should be able to use them. I think it should be net, like mandatory, really. Like I suppose people religiously will believe strongly against it. However, I just don't think it's not necessary to have the organs when you're dead, is it? And someone else might not die because they could use yours. Would you opt out? No, because oh, I'm already a donor, so I would opt in. Wouldn't really make any difference to me, I'll be dead. Well, Ollie Lewington has had a double lung transplant and joins us now. Morning, Ollie. Good morning, Ian. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. You sound... I don't know what I expected you to sound like. I, I think I expected you to sound all raspy and wheezy, but you sound young, fit and alive. Tell me your story, Ollie. What happened? Well, if you'd spoken to me five and a half years ago, I would have sounded wheezy and raspy and probably wouldn't have been able to talk to you for very long. But uh, in November 2007, I was given... I think the greatest gift that anybody can receive, which was a new pair of lungs, and I'm now as fit and healthy as just about anybody else, I'd say. What was wrong with your lungs? Why did you need new ones? I had cystic fibrosis, which is the UK's most common life-threatening genetic disease, and it basically eats away at your lungs to a point where they don't work anymore. And by the time I got a transplant, I waited two and a half years on the transplant list when I'd only been given two years to live. So I was really living on borrowed time. And I think we all knew that that Christmas 2007 was probably likely to be my last if I didn't receive that transplant in time. How old are you, Ollie? I'm 31 now. Uh And so last year I 
Uh, I turned 30, I got married, and I celebrated my fifth anniversary post-transplant. Wow. So it was a phenomenal year, and I don't think any of my family ever thought that I would reach 30. I don't think we ever thought it was an age I was going to get to. So you were 25 when you thought you were celebrating your last Christmas. How do, do you and your parents, if there's, how do your family cope with, with that, thinking this is the last Christmas you, you could be celebrating? I think you, everybody copes with it in different ways. We tried not to acknowledge it, I think. You tend to live from moment to moment when you're on the transplant list. It's very much a life lived on pause. And so you just take each anniversary as it comes. So I celebrated my 25th birthday in the May, and then I was looking ahead and thinking, well, it's my girlfriend's birthday in August, so I'll see if I can get to that. It's my mum's birthday in October. I'll see if I can get to that. Then I've got Christmas. Then my brother's birthday at the end of January. I wonder if I'll be able to, to make it to there. You just live moment to moment. And so you're on the waiting list for, for lungs for, for two and a half years. Were there false alarms in that period? Did you get phone calls saying, d- d- pack a bag, we might have something for you? Or was yeah. the phone silent? That, no, no, it, it rang four times um, while I was on the waiting list. And I had, so I had, I had four false alarms, which... Is, is relatively common with lungs because they're such delicate organs. Mm. When they're being transported and when they're being checked to see whether or not they're viable for transplant, you need to have the recipient being prepared so that if they are viable, they can go straight into the recipient and save their life. Mm. The reality of that means that sometimes you're right ready to go, you're all ready to, to be wheeled down to theatre and a transplant coordinator comes in and says, I'm really sorry. Mm that it's not going ahead. And that is utterly devastating. Just the, the knowledge that you are so close to that new life and it's, it kind of feels like it's been taken away from you. You finally got the, the lungs after two and a half years. Uh, I, I would imagine it's... Uh, I mean, it's amazing what they can do, isn't it? As my mum would say, but it is amazing what they can do. They can put some lungs in someone and they work. Is it painful afterwards? What's the rehabilitation like after, after you've had that operation? Well, yes. It is painful. I think if you essentially get cut in half and have two of your major organs removed and replaced with someone else's, it's not, you know, it's not a small procedure. It ain't going to be fun, is it? No, exactly. No. But, you know, everything that I went through, the, uh, the six weeks that I spent in hospital, the three or four months I spent recovering and getting back up to speed afterwards, it's all worth it because I've now got a life that I, I didn't dare to dream about when I was on the waiting list because... You just didn't know if you were ever going to get here. And what can, can you can you do everything like, uh, in inverted commas, a normal person would do, Ollie? Have you got limitations? Not really. I mean, there's, there's a few limitations just in terms of making sure that I try to protect myself from picking up infections and things like that. So, you know, going swimming in stagnant water <laughs> and things like that. You know, oh, you've not got to stop wind... swimming in stagnant water, have you, Ollie? <laughs> oh, nuts! Life isn't worth living! Exactly. I mean, the, the, biggest, the biggest adjustment that I had to make was that I'm not allowed to eat grapefruit anymore. <laughs> That's the one thing that we get told you absolutely cannot do post-transplant, that, to eat grapefruit. What does grapefruit do? It interacts with the immunosuppressant drug. Oh, OK, yes, I've heard that. Can... That you basically put yourself at massive risk of rejecting the lungs. And uh, if it's not too personal a question, uh, have you got a normal lifespan ahead of you? I mean, are these lungs going to last for the next, what, 40, 50 years? No, in right. short. It's not, transplant is not a magic bullet. Yeah. At some point, my body will recognise that it's got these two alien objects inside it and it will rebel against them and attack them and destroy them. Right. Now, the reality is we have no idea when that's likely to come. It could come in the next couple of weeks. It could come in the next couple of months. It could come 10, 20 years down the line. Mm. There are people who've had lung transplants who are now alive 25 years afterwards. So mm. we genuinely have no idea. They, frankly, once you get past the first five years, people tend to, the, well, the doctors tend to say, you're pretty much on an even keel. It's, you know, your guess is as good as ours. Mm. But the, the, I could talk to you all day. It's absolutely fascinating. But the, the, the thing, reason we're talking about this today is the opt-out system that, that is possibly being introduced in Wales. What do you think of an opt-out system for organ donation? It's a really difficult one because on the face of it, it's a really good idea because 
as you said, who would opt out of being an organ donor? And, and the reality is that 75% of the country say that they would be willing for their organs to be donated. But only, I think, 31% at the moment are on the organ donor register. So, you know, there's, there's a good 45% of the country who are willing but not registered to donate their organs. So there's a huge pool that we're losing there. But at the same time, I think that it's slightly misguided in as much as it requires a lot of investment in publicity to make people aware of the fact that their organs will be used unless they have specifically opted out. And actually, the Spanish system is the one that's held up to be the, the sort of paragon of virtue of organ donation. And the guy who pioneered that said that, that their system of presumed consent really didn't make any difference to the rate of organ donation. What made the difference was a huge investment that the Spanish government put into the organ donation system in terms of surgical teams and organ retrieval teams and donor coordinators and a whole raft of infrastructure changes mm. that they made to enable more transplants to happen. And actually, the money that the Welsh Assembly are going to have to spend within Wales to publicise this, I think would be far better spent building that infrastructure so that the rest of us can worry about talking about this, about raising the awareness levels with the public, and, and trying to get people onto the organ donor register so that the NHS can then cope with the massive influx of additional organs mm. and, and the increased number of lives that they can save. Can I ask you a question? After nine o'clock, my, uh, my colleague JVS is, is going to be talking about this, and he's asking, is there anything wrong with saying no to organ donation? What do you think, Holly, as someone who's had a lung transplant? Uh, I would be disappointed if someone said no to organ donation but at the same time everybody has their own view and my my big thing has always been that if 25 percent of the country even if they support organ donation wouldn't be happy for their organs to be used frankly they're not the people that we need to argue with they're not the people that we need to talk to they're not the people that we need to convince because they have their set ideas. If we can talk to that 45% of the country who support it but haven't done anything about it yet, then actually most of these arguments become academic. So the great thing about the Welsh Assembly decision today, whichever way it goes, is that people are going to spend most of the day today talking about organ donation, and that's the main thing. The, the one thing I'd say to everyone out there who's listening to this is please just talk to your family, talk to your loved ones, say, this is what I want if the worst should happen, so that when the question comes, everybody understands what your wishes were. Finally, Ollie, this is just me being nosy. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Was there a sense of guilt when you got those lungs? Because someone died uh, and, and you lived. Was there any guilt associated with that at all? It's a very difficult one. I wouldn't say... I feel guilty mm. for it. I came to terms with the fact that actually, regardless, my donor would have died. Nothing that I did by being listed for a transplant caused my donor to die. So those lungs, frankly, would have gone to waste. The fact that they and their family agreed that I could have them mm. is absolutely amazing, totally remarkable and courageous. And... Yes, it's something that you struggle with, the fact that you're waiting for someone to die when you're waiting on the transplant list. But actually, that person is going to die anyway, and nothing that you do is going to change that. Ollie, I appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much. No worries. Thanks very much, Ian. Was Ollie uh, Lewington had a double lung transplant. He puts the case forward for everyone being on the donor register, doesn't he? He's now got a life because of someone else's donor card. So is there any argument for, for anybody to say, no, actually, I don't want to give... I'm not going to give my lungs. Uh, I'm not going to give my kid. Is there any argument for that? There can't be, can there? 08459 four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Really slow at the moment on the M1 southbound. It's looking busy as you come from Luton Airport down toward Redboard Junction 10 to 9. But we've also had a text come in from Phil who said that he was going along the Luton Airport spur. So from Junction 10 up toward Junction 10A. 
and it's looking really really busy there looking at the speed sensors it is both ways are looking slow in fact so whether you're leaving the motorway and heading off toward the a1081 or coming onto the motorway it's looking busy and the roundabouts in particular are looking slow everything else on the m1 seems to be moving all right for the minute though m25 you've got clockwise delays into the roadworks anti-clockwise looking slow through the works as well particularly past potter's bar and around chesant at junction 25 and then you've got queuing traffic as well as you continue round the anti-clockwise carriageway a patch of it as you go past the m1 at junction 21 then it's slowed down toward the m40 with a bit of a queue going past junction 16 then it eases up a little but probably will slow again before you get to the m4 if you're heading that far round everything moving quite nicely on the m40 for the minute delays on the a404 though from high wycombe toward marlow and then on the trains we have problems for london midland 15 minute delays euston to milton Keynes because of a signaling problem at wembley central earlier this morning they've sorted it out residual delays for the minute and it's affecting virgin services as well adam glynn bbc three counties radio thank you very much Right, 8.17. It's uh, Tuesday, the 2nd of July. I'm Ian Lee. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Child protection experts say live footage of children being abused is increasingly available on the internet. Luton Council has given the go-ahead for dispersal orders to be served in the town's red light district. In sport, Australia Rugby Union captain James Horwill says he feels vindicated after being cleared to play in the deciding test against the Lions on Saturday. The weather today for beds, hearts and bucks, mostly dry with sunny spells and a top temperature of 19 degrees. Coming up, moves are underway to try and prevent the number of people falling over and injuring themselves in Milton Keynes. What? BBC Three Counties Radio, your local stories. I have a friend who runs a hairdresser's and one of her members of staff is stealing the takings. So what would the advice from the police be? We'll find out, Sally. Your local life. Yesterday we were talking about the problem of shoplifting. So what can you do if you have staff who, um, to put it eloquently, are a bit light-fingered? Your local radio station. The one thing which seems to actually solve the problem for them, they all said, was I put in CCTV cameras. This is... Is BBC Three Counties Radio. Jonathan Vernon Smith is here looking very smart. I've got a bit um, deaf in one ear as well. What's going on? What's here? going on in here? Sabotage. The computers are, fa- are failing, the earphones are failing. I worked at another BBC radio station at the weekend. Let's oh, just yes. say the um, facilities were very, very luxurious. Were they? There was. I had someone to give me a foot massage while I was on air. Oh, it was incredible. Really? Yes. How nice. Halfway through, a gentleman came in and said, I'm popping out to uh, get a posh coffee. Would you like one? Yes, I would like one, please. Incredible. Back rubs, the, the works. Oh. Well... <clears throat> All paid for by the licence payer as well, which made it even more satisfying. I wasn't paying for it. This lot were paying for it. Well done, them. They provided foot massages on the licence fee? Yes. I don't believe a word of it. I did. They had those chairs. You know those chairs where you sit down? You get them in garden centres and everyone tries them but never buys them. (laughs) The chairs where you sit down... <laughs> and <laughs> you don't, no one buys them. I so know a lot of mean, money, though. but they're, they're nice to try for ten minutes. You sit down and you press it, and it gives you a back massage. Have you ever been to New York? Um, in America, yeah, yes, I've been there. Yes, they've got a, a shop. Have you been into Bed Bath and Beyond? I've not been there. I no. love Bed Bath and Beyond. Yeah. Whenever I go to the states, I always spend hours in Bed Bath mm. and Beyond, and they have what kind not, of stuff do they do there? Well, everything for the bed, the bath, and beyond. <laughs> Uh, they've got a whole array of those massage chairs all yeah. lined up. Yeah. And you can just... Because after you've had a day walking around New York, you know, you're a bit stiff and achy. Yeah. So always make sure you plan a trip to Bed Bath & Beyond. Yeah. Just after lunch, have a massage in the chair. The thing is, because they love the, the English accent anyway, but you sound quite posh English. They think I'm Australian because I speak a bit common. But you sound, they must love you, you over there. They must think you're an eccentric millionaire. Well, I always, I always play up to it. Of course bit. you do. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Hello there, my good man. I'd like a finest room in your hotel, please. <laughs> oh, I bet you're fun in New York. Not in England. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you're, you are fun in so many, many places. Oh, oh thanks very much. <laughs> I, I know. But that was meant as a compliment. It came out as an insult. What's on your show today? Well, uh, picking up on the organ donation story this morning, yep. uh, it's a subject that I'm very passionate about. I'm going to try to bite my lip a little today. Okay. I tend to get on my high horse. It's one of those subjects I, I can't keep quiet about it's hard if you have any shred of intelligence it's hard to be uh, impassionate about 
<laughs> I'll say it. I know you won't. I'll say it. Go on. <laughs> Well, from nine this morning, is there anything wrong with saying no to organ donation? Uh, Wales, as you've been discussing this morning, could become the only country in the UK to introduce an opt-out system for organ donation if politicians vote to change the law later today. The Welsh Government wants to introduce a system where everyone's organs will be taken when they die unless they've specifically requested not to be a donor. Well, from nine this morning, I want your views. Is there anything wrong with saying no to organ donation? For me personally, I can't understand why anyone would rather see their loved ones or their own organs burnt or buried when, frankly, they could go to saving other people's lives. Mm. I can't understand it. Mm. But perhaps you can. And perhaps you totally understand why some people really have a a major problem with it. I'd like your views from nine this morning. Is there anything wrong with saying no to organ donation? When Ian finishes, I'll start, but the same same number applies, 08459 455 555. Wouldn't it be good? I'm I'm going to suggest this to the bosses uh, via email. Don't meet them face to face. Uh, But if each show had its own phone number... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Can you imagine? It would just keep people on their toes a little bit, wouldn't it? And if, if they called this number after nine, they'd get my answer phone. <laughs> That'd be nice, <laughs> wouldn't it? Well, it's certainly a different idea. That, it, it's not been introduced, though, so this is the number you need to call. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. <laughs> just this something very rude to Jonathan Vernon Smith. I know how naughty, how naughty of me to do such a thing, I, I, isn't it? Just uh, we've had um, some. Uh, well, look, it's an email on uh, don- uh, organ donations here. Our seventeen. Here we go. Look at this. This is from Karen, and this is the kind of honesty and openness you get when you're doing a show like this. Our seventeen-year-old daughter died in two thousand and seven. She carried an organ donation card, so we carried out her wishes. I think it should be compulsory to uh, carry a card, but people should have the choice. Therefore. Uh, to opt out in the first place. I also say if you do not want to donate your organs, you have no right to have a transplant either. Well, thank you very much, Karen. I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm... I'm I wonder if, if you... If someone you, you know has, has donated their organs, do, do you get some sense of satisfaction that negates part of the loss, knowing that they've gone on to help somebody? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. Emma's from Milton Keynes on this. Good morning, Emma. Morning, Ian. Emma, would you donate your organs? Well, I, a, until a couple of years ago, I would have said no, and it's for no kind of plausible reason, not for religious or anything else. It's just something I had in my mind that I wouldn't. But then I found out that you can actually elect to donate just certain organs. So I've actually got my organ card in front of me and I, I will give my lungs, kidneys, pancreas, liver, small bowel and tissue, um, but I won't give my eyes and heart. I knew you were going to say eyes, Emma. Well, <laughs> I have done this in, in various other lives. I've done a phone in about this and so many people said you can take anything you want, but don't mm. touch my eyes. Why is that? Uh, I... No reason. I have really, um, I would class myself as a fairly logical, sane person. Yeah. Um, don't know. I don't, it's not that I believe in afterlife. No, I... You don't think you'd be a blind ghost no or anything? It's a gut feeling. Pardon? You, you, you don't, so you're not worried about being a blind ghost or anything? <laughs> That's not the reason. And what was, because you, know. you, you said you said originally you, you, were, you were against it personally. Again, why, why was that? Uh, what changed? Uh, honestly... Because I found out that you can elect to only donate right. certain organs rather than just um, everything. But um, the, 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 again, illogical thing for me is that whilst I'm alive, um, well, obviously now, um, Are I you sure? will donate virtually anything I can. I've, I'm on the Anthony Nolan bone marrow transplant. Right. Within about a month of it, going on it about 20 years ago, um, I was contacted to donate bone marrow, which I did. Wow, um, well done. I'm a regular blood donor, um, and I have a reasonably rare blood group and conscious that it might help other people, so regularly give blood. I enjoy, just, I enjoy the blood donation. <laughs> It's fun. It's fun. Quite satisfying. It, you you that, can yeah. feel very, very smug with yourself, 
and you get, you get, you get you, I always get the little sticker, and I, get, I sit around and have the biscuits and watch a bit of TV, and I chat oh, to yeah. the. I love it, and you are allowed to feel smug for the rest of the week, <laughs> and, I, and I keep my uh, little bandage on much longer than I need to. <laughs> and why not? The final question, Emma. Why not the heart as well? That was the other thing you said you would you would keep. I'd love to give a logical reason, but I really can't. No. I, I really can't. It's just something inside me says don't feel comfortable with donating those organs. There's no logical reason whatsoever. Have you spoken to your family about this? Do your family... Because I think part of the problem is people don't often tell their husband or their wives or, or, or their, their closest no, people my, to them. My, my family um, respect my wishes, but they don't really understand it. Right. My father has actually um, donated his whole body for wow. um, medical research. Oh. So he's absolutely got the opposite... Um, due, to, due to me and all my family um, have donor cards and my um, younger brother sadly died a couple of years ago and um, the family donated uh, um, whatever organs um, they could find uh, to be useful for other people so um, family is nothing to do with any kind of family pressure it's just simply my logical view on it and was there, and I, will, I keep saying the last question, I will let you go in a second. Was there, I, I'm, I'm, you know, losing a brother m- must be an awful thing. Was there any relief from knowing that, that, that out of that tragedy other people w- were benefiting? Oh, hu- well, hugely. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, any, any, any gain that somebody else can get, I mean, your last one, Mr. Lewington, was it? Yeah. Um, just a huge inspiration and a good reason for uh, people to donate organs. Well, yeah, when you hear stories like that, where it, it's happened and it's worked and it's given someone a life who was going to die, uh, um, it does. Emma, thank you very much. Emma from Milton Keynes. We'll speak to Andrea after, after the news. Uh, Emma from Milton Keynes. Uh, uh, I've heard this so many times. Yeah, I wouldn't give the eyes. I wouldn't give the eyes. <laughs> Um, and there is no logical, scientific, rational explanation for it, is it? I didn't know until quite recently you could donate your eyes. You can help people see. Isn't that amazing? It's, it is amazing what we can do. But uh, 08459 455 555. What do you, you heard what Emma said there. A few years ago, she was against organ donation. Now she's pretty much for it. But, but, but the heart and the eyes, she's keeping those for herself. 08459 four double five five double five. You can go to facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR or you can send me a text 81333. Start your text 3CR. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Some delays on the A1 from St Neots toward the Black Cat Roundabout. It's definitely looking slow and it's pretty busy from there down towards Sandy as well. Into Bedford you might find it a little bit slow as you travel in from Bromham. The A428 looking just a little bit slow and then onto the A4280. Actually it starts to ease off once you get right into Bedford. Things on the M1 moving well in most places. We've got short delays though as you come south, down the southbound side from Junction 10 at Luton Airport toward 9 at Redbourne and then it's very slow on the Luton Airport spur. We had our text in from Phil early this morning. Speed tents are still showing some delays down the spur and round the two roundabouts there. So Junction 10 to 10A. Clockwise M25 you've got heavy traffic into the roadworks. Anti-clockwise looking just as busy particularly from Chesant at Junction 25 toward Potter's Bar at Junction 24. You've then got slow-moving traffic past the M1 at Junction 21 and some further delays as you go past Rickmansworth and down toward the M40. Looking at the A1 into London, still queuing in Boreham Wood, Stirling Corner down toward Mill Hill Circus. And 15-minute delays for both London Midland and Virgin Train Services, Euston to Milton Keynes Central, after a signalling problem earlier this morning at Wembley Central Station. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Across beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning with the 8.30 News and Sports. I'm Catherine Boyle. The headlines, child protection experts say live footage of children being sexually abused is increasingly available on the internet. Luton Borough Council has given the go-ahead for dispersal orders to be served in the town's red light district. And the Welsh Assembly will vote today on whether to introduce presumed consent for organ donation. Three Counties Sports. BBC Three Counties Radio. 
Australian captain James Horwell has been cleared to play in Saturday's third and deciding rugby union test against the British and Irish Lions. Our correspondent Ian Robertson reports. There was a great deal of surprise when James Horwell was cleared after he was cited for stamping on Alan Wynne Jones during the first test. The QC from New Zealand who heard the case concluded that on the balance of probabilities he could not find an intentional or deliberate action of stamping or trampling. The International Rugby Board appealed against this decision. Today, Graham Mew, the independent appeal officer, rejected that appeal. He stated the judicial officer was not manifestly unreasonable or clearly wrong in his decision. So James Horwell can now play in the third test on Saturday. Andy Murray will play Fernando Vadasco in the Wimbledon quarterfinals after beating Mikhail Eugenie in straight set. Today it's women's quarterfinals day. On centre court, the top remaining seed, Agnieszka Radvanska, takes on Lina. That's followed by former champion Petra Kritova against Kirsten Flipkins. Over on court one, Sabine Lezicki, who knocked out Serena Williams, plays Kaya Kanepi, while Sloane Stevens takes on Marion Bartoli. Olympic long jump champion Greg Rutherford's been responding to criticism of his form since London 2012. The Woburn Sands based athlete finished second at the Diamond League meeting in Birmingham over the weekend but says he's not fully fit due to fluid on the knee. It's just about trying to stimulate my body to, to remove it but for whatever reason it's been really persistent and won't go and the issue has been with that if you look at my jumps technically at the moment I'm not able to do the lateral step that I was doing so well last year that was helping me jump so far. And I'm having to revert back to something that I'm not comfortable with. And that's your latest news and sport. I'll be back with more at nine o'clock. Across beds, hearts and bucks. This is Ian Lee. BBC Three Counties Radio. BBC Three Counties Radio uh, here. And uh, to, to answer the... I'm going to send out a secret message. This is a secret code. Yes, my tea does taste funny. It's a secret message. I'm just, and I shouldn't really use the BBC airwaves for my own means, but, I, but every now and then I do. And yes, my tea does taste funny. Okay, that's all you need to know. Coming up before JVS at nine o'clock, we'll be talking about why a disproportionate number of people are falling over in Milton Keynes. Have you noticed it? It's true. We'll discuss that and more. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. If you've got young ears, we're going to talk about adult things for the next five six minutes. So you may want to um, put them in front of CBBS or something. Uh, child protection experts are warning that live footage of children being abused is increasingly being made available on the internet. The Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre, known as CEOP, says there's been an overall rise in the number of indecent images reported, and estimates that about fifty thousand people in the UK are involved in down downloading and transferring images of abuse. Well, Kate Fisher is from SEOP and joins me now. Morning, Kate. Morning. Kate, because there are so many methods of transferring images online, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised at the increase. Is there anything we can do about it? Well, I think it's important to point out that although we have seen an increase, um, and there's been a twofold increase in the previous year, um, I think it's important to say that most of those images um, will be circulated a number of times, so they won't all be unique images. Um, there's certainly plenty we can do about it, and we at CEOP, along with our law enforcement partners and our industry partners, um, that's what we do on a daily basis. We try and uh, track down those offenders that are um, wanting to harm children and safeguarding children at the earliest possible opportunity. How easy is it to track these people down? Well, with technology developing at such a pace, it's always a challenge, but we're very lucky in that we have a number of technological experts who can look at the new technology, look at ways that offenders will try and exploit it, and then we can try and exploit it ourselves. There, there have been talks over the weekend of some of the big internet service providers um, uh, offering an opt-in service, so the, 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 the adult material wouldn't be accessible unless people opted in. Are things like that going to help in this situation at all? Well, I think everything that the internet industry can do and everything that we can do as law enforcement helps us to look at new ways to tackle the problem and to hopefully protect more children. And what, what powers do you have, Kate? What, how, how can you punish these people once you catch them? Well, obviously, we have all our legal, uh, legal powers in the UK and we also work with law enforcement internationally and we're constantly looking at new ways to try and um, improve legislation, which means that we can um, catch offenders... Uh, quickly and um, with protecting those children at the same time who they may want to offend against and so that we can bring them to justice and make sure that justice is served. Kate Fisher from SEOP, thank you very much indeed. Call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Organ donation. 
donation. There's no reason, is there, to not donate your organs? I, what's, what's the religious argument? We've had a couple of religious people saying, well, you know, no, we're against it. What is the religious argument? Surely, surely. Hey, the Good Samaritan, anybody? Aren't we supposed to help people when we can? Those who are less fortunate than ourselves? If you're going to heaven anyway, what's the, what's the point of carrying a full set of organs with you? Andrea's in Hitchin. Andrea, what, what do you think about all of this? Well, I, I, I'm afraid I agree with the, uh, the Welsh that it ought to be an opt-out, not an opt-in. Don't be afraid to agree with the Welsh, Andrea. We all do it at some point. <laughs> I don't do it very often. No, no. It, 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 so it, can you think of any logical reason why somebody wouldn't want to give away their organs uh, when they died? I think they're frightened of you being mutilated. I think that's, I think that's what ultimately it comes down to. I mean, the thing that, the thing that probably um, upsets me more than anything is things like corneas. Um, do people think their eyes are taken out? Because it's not quite like that. What, what happens? Because I, I assume that your eyes were taken out. What, what do they do? Well, I'm assuming they take the bit they want and they put the rest back. No, no. Could, do they not use the whole, the whole eyeball? Not, not as far as I'm aware. And, and they, you... They're going to put something in its place, aren't they? So, and you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, though, you well, are dead. To you. You've not got to read a map up to heaven or down to hell. Uh, Andrea, can I just check? When, have you got any medical training? Uh, no. OK, so no, no, we're, in, that, no, in that case, we're both coming from the same place. We're literally <laughs> groping around in the dark, perhaps in more ways uh, than one. I don't know. If we've got 23 minutes. If we can find a doctor or, who can tell us, uh, do they take the eyeball or, or not? Uh, the, the, the thing is, as well, is that, that uh, listen, I have seen people after death who, who before they died, didn't look too good. Uh, and they, they, make you look, they make you look good. They sew everything up. They put makeup on. They make, do your hair nice. You, you're not going to look like you've been hacked to pieces, would you? Uh, do, do you? Well, I hope not. No. They're, they're the prov- thing is, I say, that, you know, how, how many people have an open... We, we're, not in a, we're not in a country where we, we generally speaking, have an open coffin. You know, at the, at the um, no, service. So no. it's not a case that anyone else is going to know anyway. Uh, Andrea, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Cheryl's from Hitchin. Morning, Cheryl. Good morning. Good. What, what do you think about donation? Should we have an opt out system? No. Oh. Oh, no, no, actually, no. Yes, I do. Hang on. Right, do. Right. Let's start again. Hang on, because it gets confusing. I got confused <laughs> when I asked it. Right. <laughs> Let's go to Cheryl from Hitchin. Morning, Cheryl. Good morning. Cheryl, what do you think? Should we have an opt out system? Yes. Why do you say that so convincingly? Well, because, well, because I think it's personal choice. Um, for me, I will, I'm donating everything. They can have anything they want, whether it be for donation or whether it be for experimental. Yeah. However, my husband feels completely the opposite. So, and so he's he, not letting them touch any of his no, organs once he's gone? No, nothing. And nothing. what's his argument for that? Well... He's, I don't really know. He just doesn't, well, he doesn't believe in the afterlife at all. Right. So he feels, and he's Jewish as well, which means he gets buried rather than cremated. Right. So for him, I, it, I don't know if it's a, I don't know, he's not very religious at all, but I'm just wondering if something, you know, they feel that, I don't know. So do you believe in an afterlife? Absolutely. And yeah. yet you're prepared, because we have heard that one of the Christian arguments, I don't know what faith you is, but one of the religious arguments could be that, um, you know, if you go up to heaven, or whatever your nirvana may be, uh, if you've given a kidney and your heart, well, the, the, you won't have those in heaven. Does that not worry you? I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. I believe that your soul, and you are who you are down here... Um, but you go, you're there healthy. When you go to heaven, I believe that your, all your ailments that you ever had in life are finished because that's just oh. the skin and, that you use here. Yeah. So I, you don't need anything. I mean, they can even have my skin. They can have my eyes, anything oh. they want. Oh, your skin. Now, that's, yeah. a, that's, that's a stretch too far. What, what age are you when you go to heaven? Well, I think that you go back to your healthiest and happiest. So whether that was 20 or 30 or 50 or 10... Because I'm just wondering if I if I um, die now and I'm forty and I go up as a forty year old and then my wife dies in another forty years so she'll be nearly eighty, we'll be incompatible. Well, you might not see her up there. Oh, but, but it's heaven. May, but she might be in a different guise. You see. Oh no. Yeah. But it's it's heaven. I thought heaven. You're supposed to be with all the things that you and the people that you love the most. Well, I think that you are, but they could be in a different guise. You know, okay. and there could be, um, but I think that you, I think that you go back wherever you were happiest and healthiest. So if that was 80, yeah. which let's face it, not many people are that no. the healthiest at 80, you know, so around 40, probably that's when you 
when you are. I just think that you're not going to go up there and then be ill and unhappy. I think That's I'd be point. 20, 22, I think I'd be. I was I'd good at... 27, oh. I like that year. Oh. That was a good year. Well, the older woman. For me, if I was 22. <laughs> it's getting a bit weird. Cheryl, thank you very much indeed. Nice to talk to you. That's a phone in for another day. Uh, what age would you be if you went to heaven? Oh, eight, four, five. No, no, let, let, let's not. We're running out of time. Now, moves are underway to try and prevent the number of people falling over and injuring themselves in Milton Keynes. They want to lower the number. According to the council, there is a disproportionately high number of reported injuries from falls in the new city, given its population and size. Now, a get this, Falls Prevention Strategy and Implementation Group has been set up which will report progress to the Milton Keynes Health and Wellbeing Board. Well, Debbie Brock is the chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board in Milton Keynes and joins me now. Debbie, firstly, what is the, the Health and Wellbeing Board? Oh, well, um, hi, morning, Ian. Um, the Health and Wellbeing Board is um, a partnership um, board um, at Milton Keynes Council. Um, meeting of um, uh, health um, leaders, political leaders, um, uh, uh, local um, uh, health watch, um, and um, uh, partners. Um, and really, we, we're sort of um, there to um, improve opportunities for um, children and adults to um, enjoy a healthy, um, safe and fulfilling life. And um, you mentioned falls, and that was one of the things, one of the standout... Um, how, how many people are falling over in Milton Keynes? Um, well, we have um, a, a higher number than the England average in Milton Keynes. What um, is the England... Well, let's have some numbers. What is the England average, and what, what, what's the number in Milton Keynes? Um... I can't give you exact, exact numbers. Is it secret? Um, but um, you will find that all in all the source documentation, the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment and the Public Health right. um, Profile for MK. Um, and and uh, I think the important thing is that um, you know, 10, 11 hip fractures um, in the over 65s is um, very high. We're reducing that through um, 2011, 12 and 12, 13. How are, they f- how, are the, how are these people falling over in Milton Keynes? Um, I think it, it, it's a variety of causes. I mean, um, I think if you look at the prevention work we're trying to do, we're trying to um, strengthen um, people's uh, leg, leg strength, improve people's leg strength, improve physical mobility. So some internal factors, but also, um, if you like, external factors, extrinsic things, so perhaps you've got uneven rises in your floor at home or um, you know, um, un- mm. unsafe carpets or um, pavements which are uneven. Um, ah, so it could any- be the council's fault. I, I think it's, it's um, a-, a picture where there are a variety of reasons why people fall over. Uneven um, pavements would be the council, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, is there a chance that the council are worried uh, of uh, compensation claims against them? Um, well, I mean, that, that, that's something that, that would happen anyway, but um, uh, uneven pavements is one of those things which um, the um, administration of the council, of which I'm a, I'm a part, um, is completely investing in those £50 million pounds coming forward. For I just don't understand. I, I, I'm struggling to work out, Debbie, why, why more people are falling, why more people in Milton Keynes would have uneven carpet or would, would be falling over more? Well, as I say, it's, it's a, it's, it is a variety of reasons. Yes, but why would these apply the more to Milton Keynes thing, citizens? The important thing is what we're doing to address it and that is that is across the board and that's partners across the board and that's what the um the falls prevention strategy and the working group is all about it's about how much does this all those factors into account how much does this falls prevention strategy and implementation group cost <laughs> it's impossible to put a, an absolute cost on that because Why? there are so many no, there are so many agencies and bodies which you are, must have a rough idea together i mean if i if i just sort of pinpoint one thing. Um, The the hospital has has recently put in um, a a new appointment um, uh, for a a, a post to help with the falls prevention within the hospital. And that person will be linking to people within the community health service. Debbie, this is a very nice little fluff piece, and I I, I feel we're not getting anywhere, but I, I am curious to know, how much is all of this costing? Then you must have an idea of how much the falls prevention strategy and implementation group is costing. As I say, it's Many people and many agencies... You must have a rough idea. There must, someone yeah, must have... people and many agencies... Someone must have financed this group. So I think it's... it's someone... ...about looking no, at it's not. the value of what <laughs> this work is doing. But we don't know how valuable it is if we don't know how much it costs, do we? So, someone well, must listen, have... If somebody falls over, there's a massive personal cost to that person. Debbie, Debbie, someone must have an idea. Do you have an idea, yes or no, how much this is all costing? I would know. I would not know exactly what. Well, roughly. Thing because, as I say, there are many roughly. people who are feeding into this process. Roughly. 
there, there are very many people and very many... Do you know and you're just embarrassed to say? This process. Do you know and you're just embarrassed to say? Well, the group itself costs nothing because okay. many people are coming to the table right. as a partner, as but a who's, partnership board in exactly who's funding the same this? way as the Health and Wellbeing Board. Who's many people are supporting this collective action. What okay. the And who's funding it? The council facilitates the group, but I mean that's well, then you like must a have room a booking fee. But each and every single partner involved with this concerted effort, it's the same as the Health and Wellbeing Board. Each accountable partner will have their own costs within their own organisation. But this is absolutely picking up on the priorities where we, well, look, just we people will be curious, Debbie. If, if no, people will just be curious, Debbie, where where, where their, their council tax or whatever, wherever it's being funded, where, how much it's costing, and, and why it's helping people who who may be falling over in Milton Keynes. Debbie, oh. we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you very much uh, for your time. It was. Uh, I think we were both after slightly different things. Debbie was after promoting what they're doing, and I was kind of curious as to why people were falling over in Milton Keynes and how much it was costing. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Still some delays as you come down the A1 southbound from St Neots toward the Black Cat Roundabout and then some shorter delays then into and through Sandy. Beyond there though, Biggleswade Wade and onto the A1M running quite well. You might still find a little bit of traffic past Junction 7 of the A1M then past Stevenage but it's running nicely then all the way into London until you get to Boreham and you've got the usual queues on the A1 southbound Stirling Corner toward Mill Hill Circus. The A414 in Hartford looking slow as you come from the A10 at Ware into Hartford. Delays past the London Coney roundabout both ways and it's very slow on the A414 then down toward the M25. You've got A41 delays from Hemel Hempstead down to the M25 and then on the M25 really slow through the roadworks clockwise and anti-clockwise so that's between the A1M and the A10 junctions 23 and 25 anti-clockwise also looking busy coming down from junction 18 toward the M40 at junction 16 and you've got problems on the trains London Midland and Virgin trains delays of up to 15 minutes they're just residual delays after a signalling problem earlier at Wembley Central and their services are being affected between Euston and Milton Keynes Central Adam Glynn BBC Three Counties Radio Adam thank you very much indeed Right, 8.48, it's Tuesday the 2nd of July, I'm Ian Lee, these are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. The Welsh Assembly will vote today on whether to introduce presumed consent for organ donation. Luton Borough Council has given the go-ahead for dispersal orders to be served in the town's red light district. In sport, today's women's quarter-finals will take place without Serena Williams after she was surprisingly knocked out by German Sabine Lizicki. She plays Kaya Kanepi on court one before Sloane Stevens takes on Marion Bartoli. Are any of these names real? Coming up, the people of Stevenage are being terrorised by rogue hogweed. We'll find out more before nine o'clock, but first, here's the weather with Kate Kinsella. Beds, hearts and bucks weather. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. With the cloud increasing all the while, we've still got a little bit of brightness over towards parts of Western Bedfordshire and also in Aylesbury as well. And this is going to keep going uh, through much of the morning. And the cloud will thicken and thin, and we'll get some brighter spells, but not too much in the way of all to all sunshine. Have a very small risk of a spot or two of rain developing through the course of the afternoon. But for most of us, it should stay dry, and we won't see any significant rain until this evening. The maximum temperature: 19 Celsius, 66 degrees in Fahrenheit height but the uh, wind will start to increase later on this afternoon making it feel a little bit cooler. Now the rain arrives this evening and will perhaps be quite heavy from time to time giving the gardens a good drenching. That will move through overnight turning overcast and a bit murky through to dawn tomorrow morning. Minimum temperature 12 Celsius 54 degrees in Fahrenheit. Now once that patchy light rain and murk has moved out of the way tomorrow morning it's an improving picture. Dry, brighter, some sunny spells building in and it will feel that little bit warmer. That's your forecast. Thank you very much. If you've missed any of the programmes from the last week, you've missed things like this. We knew Myra. We were brought up with Myra. She lived in the next street to us. She knew Pauline. We were devastated when we found out what they'd done. But there is a way you can hear it all again. So your friend Pauline Reed, she was just 16 when she was murdered by Brady. Go to bbc.co.uk slash three counties and click on listen again. All of our programmes are available for seven days, allowing you to listen to what you missed. bbc.co.uk slash three counties. Uh, some texts 
on organ donation. Kerry from Welling says, My son George had a heart transplant when he was a baby. Oh, my goodness. Without the selfless gift of life, we wouldn't have had the last 11 years with him. The donor is always in our thoughts. Well, there you go. If, if ever there's an argument for organ donation, it's there. Uh, Julie Murray smith says, Ian, I want to give my body to science research when I die. So if that meant opting out of donating my organs, so be it. Well, it's still kind of a similar thing. You're still furthering science in some ways. Now, hogweed. There's a a growing concern about this plant in Stevenage. It's got toxic bits in it. It's not very nice. Chris Day is from Buckinghamshire Nurseries. Chris, what exactly is hogweed? Morning, Ian. It's uh, it's a pernickety weed, um, mainly seen on the countryside, not in fields. I'm actually in my garden at the moment looking at a nice patch of it in my, oh. my farmer's field, trying to get into the garden. That's the problem. It, uh, it grows to about 12 foot tall, probably about 8 foot across when it's fully mature. A beautiful looking plant for a weed. That's the problem. It moves into people's gardens, but people don't realise it is a weed. grows and produces this wonderful sort of architectural looking plant. Then, of course, it sheds all its seeds. They then obviously infiltrate your garden, and again, of course, you've got a problem. But of course, for gardeners, it's the fact that it is very, it, it has this photosensitive reaction to your skin. So, therein lies a problem for most gardeners. So, what exactly does it do to your skin? Does it hurt? It does. It basically causes blistering. Ouch. It's basi- yeah, it's not very nice. Um, if you go on any of the, the search engines and, and uh, have a look, you'll see some really nasty cases of it as well. Ooh, I'm um, going to do that now while you're talking. Hang yeah, on, go on, carry on. It's no good. Um, and the, the problem is, obviously, uh, some people are more photosensitive to, than others, as we know, in, in life, as, so it can affect you more. So if you've got the problem in your garden... I'm oh, my goodness! Yeah. Oh, my good. Oh, my goodness! That's why they sort of suggest oh! when you remove this plant from, from the garden, you need to be fully donned out as though you're going into... Oh, look at water, that think. poor lad's skin. There's a yeah. bliss, there are blisters on his arm the yeah. size of golf balls. It's not nice. No. What can you do to get to get rid of it from your garden, yeah, Chris? Yeah, the problem with it is it's a biennial. That means it seeds itself in your garden. It sits there for a year waiting, and then in the following year it then sends out these wonderful flowers and obviously looks all lovely. And, of course, in that time it's, it's when it's most potent. So you need to remove it by hand. Having said that, you're going to have to don some decent marigold gloves. You're going to have to make sure all your skin is covered and dig individual sort of seedlings out. However, using weed killers... I think it's already been mentioned on your programme, it's probably the best way. Anything based on glyphosate, that's uh, Roundup, uh, when you go to the garden centre, and of course you can paint that on to the affected uh, plant, and that will kill it slowly but surely. It produces very hollow tube-like stems as well, so you can pour the uh, the weed killer down those as well to get rid of it. So it's, it is controllable, however, it is a bit of a garden nasty. And uh, once you've got rid of it, is that it? Or is, there, is, it, is it like that Japanese weed that, that is <laughs> just impossible to get rid of and is always there? Yeah, it's a lot easier than Japanese. Okay. It's not weed, trying goodness, but yeah, it will, the trouble is it will seed itself around, so you need to try and look at and find out what the plant looks like in its first year, and obviously remove those if you can. Chris, thank you very much indeed. My whole team of, of the, the Google um, Hogweed Blitz Sisters, third picture. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Oh, my goodness. That really is... Uh, uh, th- that's very unpleasant. Dear me. We were talking um, uh, about uh, the, the, the uh, round table, Gentlemen's Club, the round table, and I was asking someone uh, from there, well, it, is it not unfair that you have gentlemen's clubs? Well, there are ladies' clubs as well. Heather from Buckland. Heather, I believe you've actually managed to enter a ladies' circle. You've been in a ladies' circle. I was a member of ladies' circle in the early 1980s, and it was the best time of my life. It was great fun. And in those days, you had to be married to somebody in the round table to oh. belong. Um, but we, we had all sorts of fun. I mean, apart from raising money, we also used to do practical things like um, riding for the disabled... And there's also a lot of networking went on. And also, to be in round table, you had to have a business or right. a profession. Ah. And you had to be nominated as well. You couldn't just join. So round table was a little bit like the Masons then in those days? Well, no, there was, there was nothing secretive. I think their slogan was adapt, adopt, improve. Um, but apart from that, there was no kind of secret stuff. They used to have meetings every week, and we used to um, have lots of parties, lots of eating and drinking, and things like safari suppers, you know, driving to each other's houses and... Um, a safari you, uh, supper? Yeah, it's where you go to each other's houses and have different courses. 
Oh. <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, some fondue parties and things like that. Yeah, that type of thing. There, there'll be people listening, uh, Heather, who'll be curious. How, how do you get into a lady's circle? I know you've got sort of strange connotations going on here, but you have to... It's, I don't know what it's like now. I mean, this is like 30 years ago. You had to be married to a man in the rounds table. Right, yes. Uh, there was 29 members. In Aylesbury, well, the Aylesbury uh, Lady Circle, and there was also Aylesbury Vale. There was actually two groups in the Aylesbury area, and there was a separate one in Princess Risborough. It was a massive organisation, and there was a big uh, international party every year. And I, we, I went in '82, I think, and it was up in Manchester. And um, there's a, sort of acres and acres of marquees and live bands. And why did you leave, Heather? If it was so much fun, what 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 why changed? Why did I leave? Oh, I got divorced. Ah, uh, uh. <laughs> and I, I went along as a kind of single person for a bit, but it's not the same. No, really. Heather, I, I appreciate your call. Thank you, and thank you for busting me live on air. Yes, you're absolutely correct. I was being lucky. John's in Bedford. Morning, John. Good morning. Uh, you're not calling about lady circles. You've called in about organ donation. Uh, do you agree with me? We should have an opt-out system. I, I do agree, but um, my main concern was that my organs would be going to someone who shouldn't deserve them, like um, alcoholics and drug addicts. Right. Ma- mainly because I would rather sort of donate to research rather than uh, donate to someone who would be, sort of, wouldn't need them. So. Well, th- they would only go to people that, that were in requirement of them. They wouldn't just put them in someone who was healthy. Well, if someone's, like, wrecked their entire life through drinking, I yes. wouldn't want them sort of having my liver. You Even know, if I they were on drink. the straight and narrow and they, they, they were clean and sober? Um, there'd be no way to prove that. <laughs> well, if you, you, there, there would be ways to prove that they, they'd given up uh, the booze. But you can donate your body to, to medical science, I think, and, and, and specify it goes to a, a university or a medical school. And yeah, I, I would probably go down that route myself, you know, rather than saying, no, I don't want to donate and just, you know, be horrible about yes. it. I would rather donate where it's needed most. What would be nice, John, is if when you're dying, not, not you, but when one is dying, is if they could bring in a prospective candidates like the x factor or something and they bring in three candidates who put forward a story as to why they need your kidney and then you can go um i'm gonna go with number three well choice is always a good thing <laughs> it, might, it might be helpful might it, it might work oh definitely I, I would agree with that john thank you well someone needs to get in touch with simon cow because he could make this work he can make organ donation sexy make it a ratings winner and it could save lives you've got 30 seconds to explain why you want john's kidney Starting from now. And John could buzz them off if he didn't enjoy it. Uh, This morning, JVS is asking, is there anything wrong with saying no to organ donation? Travel news for beds, cards and bugs. BBC Three Counties Radio. Speed sense is still picking up a fair bit of traffic coming from St Neots down toward the Black Cap roundabout and then onwards towards Sandy, looking clear into and out of Bedford now. Some short delays along several stretches of the A5 between Dunstable and Milton Keynes, but it is running reasonably well. Leighton Buzzard may be a little bit slow as you leave Leighton Buzzard and head toward Wing on the A4146 and then joining the A418. Things running a little bit slow in Berkhamstead on the A41 from there, past Emil Hempstead down toward the M25, but certainly not as bad as some mornings. You've still got delays from High Wycombe down toward Marlow on the A404. The 414 is looking slow from Hemel Hempstead up to the M1. It's also looking slow in London Coney, but the delays of earlier this morning in Hartford look to have eased off. Short queues on the A602 from the A1M toward Hitchin. You've also got a little bit of slow-moving traffic on the Luton Airport spur of the M1. M25 anti-clockwise looking slow through the roadworks. Clockwise looking quite busy as well, particularly past Potter's Bar. And then on the trains, short delays, 15 minutes worth for London Midland and Southern because of a signalling problem at Wembley Central. Adam Glynn, BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you very much, Adam. Speak to you tomorrow. Right, that's it. JVS is up next. Until tomorrow, from me, ta-ta. On FM, AM, online and digital radio. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian. Good morning. Welcome to the JBS Show. I'm Jonathan Vernon-Smith. It's Tuesday and on today's big phone-in, is there anything wrong with saying no to organ donation?